You guys online see that all right? Yep, we can see it. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, gone through a couple of these things. I, I don't have a lot on housekeeping except that uh, I think there's coffee. We got coffee here. Yes. And I don't know if we've got other stuff coming or not. Or just lunch. I think. Just lunch. Okay. Bathrooms. You just take a left and then a quick right down the hallway. And I think the women's are just a little bit farther than the men's down there. Um, I. I like to do these things really informally. I, I appreciate the, the feedback from you um, and, and make it more interactive. I, and I know there are people here who know a lot more than I do about at HMS. And uh, I would appreciate any uh, help that people have regarding that. And I know there are people here that are just uh, kind of at the beginning of trying to learn FHMS. So we're gonna, we're gonna work to that end, at least we're gonna try to get it so people feel like they might know a little bit about it, at least in the context of what we're trying to do today. And that is to simulate rainfall and runoff into a reservoir and routing a, a storm through a reservoir. And those are uh, absolutely part of why we're here. And we'll talk to, uh, about that in a little bit. So um, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I appreciate suggestions. Um, I want it to be open and uh, hopefully we'll all learn um, as we move along here. Thank you for being here, by the way. It's early in the morning, I know. So why the heck are we here? Um, we've got a couple different things going on. So initially when Michelle contacted me, uh, her intent was to be able to um, have the ability to route uh, storms that are frequent, air quotes, um, and into a reservoir. And primarily, the, um, the interest is in reservoirs that have restrictions placed on them for various reasons. Um, and those could be that there's not a lot of confidence in the dam. Uh, being sound geotechnically it might have some stability problems, it might have seepage problems, or there are concerns with spillway sizing and being able to hydraulically route a, 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 a storm through the, the reservoir itself. So um, there are a lot of reasons that dam safety has been uh, in the position to have to compel owners to put restrictions on their water levels and therefore um, for the safety of the dam, uh, try to keep it as safe as they can. But what has been kind of a missing link is understanding, well, what can we tolerate in terms of that reservoir of the dam handling and inflow design flood? What is the, what is the flood that would um, cause concern coming into that reservoir? And is there enough capacity? Uh, how much would have raised the dam or the the reservoir against the dam. So there are a lot of concerns related to that the dam safety is trying to answer. So we're, we're going to take a look at that and we're gonna use the program HEC HMS as a tool to do it. Um, the other thing is that we wanna have at least some confidence that the storms that we are modeling to come into the reservoir are near to what an actual storm of that particular magnitude is. And so we're gonna look at some different verification processes for that as well. <clears throat> so here's some of the objectives that we're gonna to try to do today. Um, for those of you who know HEC HMS, maybe this is a refresher and we will all learn from it. Some of you are just learning it. so. Um, this will be an exercise in doing that. And I would hope that when we get to the point in the workshop where we do some interactive work and uh, looking at a model and running it and inputting uh, the data into the model that for those of you who need help, that we would have other people that would uh, help out as well and work together with that. Um, we're going to talk about what we mean by frequent, and I'm using my air quotes a lot because frequent is, uh, uh, has a specific meaning as far as what we're talking about today. So we'll, we'll talk 
cover that here in a little bit. Um, we're going to also, I, I think one of the biggest benefits of something like this is to give you um, information on where to find the data that is used as input into the model itself. And so we're going to go through that process as well and look at what these data sources are. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll get to the point where you can develop these HMS models in a relatively quick fashion um, and be confident about it. Um, and then understand, is it reasonable? How, how do we verify it? What are we going to look at as far as trying to do that verification? Um, there is a document that Dam Safety has out that uh, has some pretty good suggestions on how you actually go through the verification process. And how would you then adjust the model to make it so it's calibrated? And um, we're going to use two terms today. One is calibration. The other is pseudo calibration. We'll talk about the difference between those. And uh, again, we'll, we'll get feedback from you guys on, on a lot of this as we move along. And then finally, what's the impact of this design storm coming into a reservoir? And how does it res affect the reservoir and the dam itself? And how would it then direct dam safety in um, working with the owner on how they would actually operate that dam. Okay, so um, dam safety, there's, uh, the, we are typically working with very large, um, sometimes unreasonably large storms in order to try to maintain some sort of safety built in with the dam. So what we do is design spillways to an ungodly storm that um, where the spillway is large enough to pass this really large storm and not fail the dam. But in what we're doing now, we're going to look at what we would consider to be a more frequent storm. And we'll talk about that in a second. So in terms of dam safety for spillway design, we're looking at our floods, or flows that are equal to or greater than 500 year return periods. And it can go all the way up to what they call a PMF, probable maximum flood. We won't get into that, but it's big. That's all you need to know about it. Um, we know that with these large storms, there's a lot of uncertainty because we rarely ever see a storm that large. So what you're modeling is a little bit of a guess. You try to, um, Verify it using smaller storms, maybe a hundred year storm, but you're then extrapolating out beyond that. So there is quite a bit of uncertainty as far as that's concerned. When you're talking about soils, usually these very large storms are accompanied by long periods of rain. And the initial abstraction that you would put into a model as far as the rainfall that goes into the ground is probably pretty low. Um, <clears throat> but you would assume that there is uh, the, the soil is at or near a saturation type level. Um, there are then these limited options for verification. I covered that. Where we look at smaller storms to try to verify that this larger storm is reasonably accurate. What we're going to talk about today are what we're, we're terming frequent storms, but that would be anything that's less than or equal to a 100 year return uh, flood. And, and the reason we're looking at these, again, we're looking at these storms that could occur while a dam is placed uh, at, under a, a restriction. So uh, we're trying to identify to the owners what that risk might be with these storms that come into it. Um, when you try to verify this, you have some pretty solid data, right? We, we can usually find some sort of information that would tell us what a peak 10-year flood is for a particular base. We've got quite a bit of information that would help us with that. So we can apply that to these storms and, and try to see, make sure that we are at least feeling comfortable that we're in a reasonable range of accuracy within that. <clears throat> With the initial abstraction, um, you would 
use whatever is represented for that basin and, and pick HMS has the ability to calculate that for you based on the uh, SCS or Soil Conservation Service um, interaction between the curve number and the uh, initial extraction of the soil itself. Um, more options for verification. Like I said, there's a lot of data out there, gauge data and um, data that's been developed in terms of regression equations that are fairly widely used and seem to be improving all the time. This is a, a, a great graph. Carl brought this graph to my attention. This comes from TR55, which is an NRCS publication for um, urban hydrology. <clears throat> But I like it because what it, it, this would be a great thing to show a dam owner that would say, over this period of time, you run this risk, this probability that these storms could occur. And an example would be within a 10 year period of time, you would run about a 65% chance that a 10 year storm would occur at, at, for that dam. So um, the longer, you have the restriction on the dam, the more likely that you will have uh, floods occurring in there. A uh, two year will surely occur within that particular period of time. And it just depends on what the situation is, and what the, the, uh, the, rest, the restriction is all about and what is the plan for the owner to try to help repair or uh, take care of whatever condition is the dam is um, having problems with. <clears throat> okay. So HEC HMS, I think I'm way ahead of schedule here, but that's okay. Um, if you look at your, your uh, deal here, when's our first break? I just need to know that. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, okay. <clears throat> Well, let's talk a little about HEC HMS. So HEC HMS is a computer program, obviously. Um, the initials, uh, HEC stands for the Hydrologic Engineering Center at, with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and they developed this program that they call the Hydrologic Modeling System or HMS. So it's called HEC HMS. And um, <clears throat> this is the, the link to download it. Um, the nice thing about it, it's free. Public can access this uh, this software. The uh, maybe the downfall is that you're left up to yourself to actually make sure that you're running it correctly. So that's part of the reason why we're here to help each other try to do that. Um, it's a versatile program. Um, it it does all kinds of things. So it does uh, rainfall runoff modeling. So you can simulate a rainfall event on a particular area, it will calculate the losses for that area for the soil and the ground cover, and then it will predict a hydrograph that comes out of that basin. It also then has the ability to route floods, which I think is a powerful tool. Um, it, it will route floods down a, a river channel uh, using several different methods, but it will account for the storage that can take place as a flood rights routes down and um, uh, simulates the attenuation of that peak flood as it moves downstream. It can also then route the flood through a reservoir. So if you put in reservoir attributes within the model and you route a hydrograph into there, it will tell you how that reservoir will uh, uh, act as a storage for that, a buffer, and then what the outflow might be depending on whatever the outflow conditions are for it. Um, it's used widely by dam safety. There are a lot of other programs out there that are um, a little more complex, but they uh, are probably a little less stable. Um, things like HEC RAS is one that can do uh, uh, unsteady flow simulation like this, but uh, HEC HMS seems to be, at least for now, the, the way to do it. There are other if you're trying to accomplish other types of analyses, there are programs that are uh, probably better at this than um, what we have in HMS. 
Here's really the broad overview of how this works. Um, at the end, you get model output, but that depends on what you input into it. So <clears throat> the model output is based on two basic things, a, bike, a basin model that describes the, the, the basin itself, the, the watershed, and what it, if there's a reservoir or anything else associated with it. Um, it has a meteorological model that simulates the rainfall that's activating the, the runoff. And then it has what they call control specifications, which uh, looks impressive, but it's a, just a small text box where you put in data for how long you're going to simulate it and at what time steps. <clears throat> the basin model um, I'm showing here has um, all kinds of different aspects to it. And um, these are the terminology that, that HEC HMS uses, where they say, what is the loss? In other words, what's the infiltration and storage within that basin? So you have to input the soil and the ground cover data in to um, know what that loss actually is. Another term they use is transform. And that's just another term for the unit hydrograph or understanding what is the shape of the hydrograph that will come out of this, this particular basin. So you have to put in parameters that identify the unit hydrograph for it. <clears throat> Base flow means what's the normal flow during the period of time that you're doing your simulation. And that then is added to the hydrograph that you Use and in most cases, when when we're dealing with dam safety, very large floods, base flow is practically negligible. But when we're talking about these more frequent storms, like a two, five, ten year flood, all of a sudden base flow can make a huge difference. We'll talk about that a little bit more. <clears throat> and then. There's the reservoir and the spillway and the dam data that can be input into it. And it comes through these, uh, these components within the program that are called paired data. And paired data means that you're combining two variables and say for a, a reservoir, it's elevation and storage. And pairing them together, it's, it's graphical data basically. Um, <clears throat> You can define the reservoir, you can define the spillway by an elevation and a, a discharge. Okay, <clears throat> then you can also put in dam data that identifies the height of the dam, etc. Um, the meteorological model then means that you're inputting rainfall hiatographs. Okay, a hiatograph is uh, incremental depths over time. Uh, for a rainfall event. And that is put through input through a component that they call time series in, in HEC HMS. Now it's not time series, it's not only, I'm putting up what's typical for what we're looking at here, but it could also mean that you would have gauge data like a, a discharge in time instead of depth in time. Okay, um, but that would be for another purpose than what we're trying to do here. It, it all comes together and you get a model output and uh, you can judge then uh, what's happening within the model. Any questions on, on that or comments? Uh, um, for what we're doing today, would there be any big advantage of using HEC HMS over um, a simpler program which is WinTR20? It's a good question. I, I don't know. How does dam safety do something like that? Like, You've just used HMS. Okay. But, um, I mean, do you accept a simpler type thing? Like, yeah, well, although we've never really seen it. Okay. Well, WinTR20, the nice part about it is heck, heck HMS, like you said, does. Ton of stuff, but sometimes that just 
it's hard to know how many of these boxes to check and uncheck. You even mentioned one of them in your lecture later on. Oh, don't forget to check this box, you know, because yeah. you know you're well, you actually read it. it. Wow. Yeah, That's yeah. Good. yeah. So I'll just throw that out is WinTR20, <laughs> it doesn't do nearly as much as Heck HMS. It doesn't do a lot of things well that Heck HMS does well. But if you're just taking water off a very simple drainage and putting it into a reservoir and want to know if it's going to overtop, that's what it does. I mean, it does that using, uh, it's from the NRCS, so it uses the SCS curve number, curve number. all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I use the fault to as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. What, what's the name of that program again? I'm not familiar. It's TR20. It's been around for years and years. Now they have a Windows version. A Windows called Win TR20. Oh, they do? It's, okay. See, I wasn't even aware of that. Put off by the NRCS. Oh. oh. See? Okay. Do we learn new things? It was one of my questions I was writing down. Other HEC HMS <coughs> type programs. Like, I'm, I know um, HydroCAD. Is something that people use, but I thought that was more for urban situations where you had parking lots and things like that. But yeah, I'm not familiar with that either. Is that a commercial mm -hmm. product? I, I haven't used it, but I. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I think, you know, something like ER20 would be great. I didn't know they had a Windows version of it, but yeah. Today, we're going to focus on HEC HMS, though, and try to at least understand the basics between it. So if you were to open a, a HEC HMS program, this is what it looks like. And um, I'm, I'm going to give you the cringe factor here because you're going to see a lot of visuals just like this coming up. And I apologize. I just couldn't figure out how to convey the information, especially for people that are new to HEC HMS without showing you a bunch of screenshots that look like this. But this is what the program looks like when you open it up. And when it's brand new, you don't see anything that's right here as far as the, the, uh, the tree that shows the different folders that are within the program. So you have to open it up, open up some program. But what we're using today will look something like this. Um, We'll talk about this in a second, but one of the features that um, later we're going to have Anthony and Brent talk about is this terrain feature that I was not familiar with, but it uses GIS data to give you a view of the basin itself, and it can be used to calculate the basin area in it, and we'll, I'll let them talk about it where that data comes from. But you get an image that looks like that, and the black line that's in that image um, denotes the, the drainage basin itself. If you didn't have that, all you would see were these little icons that are embedded in this image, which is a sub-basin and then a reservoir down here. <clears throat> this helps give a little bit of a visual for that. So looking at some of the components, I am going to start with the terrain data first because that's really kind of where, um, <clears throat> at least in this model that Brent and Anthony helped me with, they, they use this terrain to do that. And you can, all it has is that you put in a file name that contains a GIS shape file, basically. Is that? The terrain is, it's a gridded data file. Okay. Um, like a raster. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, another important part about that is it has to be projected to to a coordinate system that is compatible with HMS. Okay. Um, which a lot of them are. Uh, I had the best luck with like a UTM uh, zone 12 N. Uh, like it's WGS 84. Uh, I it's. I don't know, projection names are long and confusing, but it's written in uh, the example slides what, what the projection is. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of people that are nodding with you. Yeah, so. I tried to use the, the state plane one that our LIDAR is in and the floodplain program uses, the state plane 2500 FIPS, stuff like that. 
and really it didn't seem to like that one as well. And that could have been something that I was doing wrong with uh, some of the GIS processing, but it, the, the WGS seemed to be much happier. I'll just add if you guys can hear me over Zoom yep. that um, one of the supplements that we're working on to this guidance document shows you how to pull this terrain data together. Um, it has some, as Gary kind of mentioned, it has some advanced abilities if you want to do more advanced modeling, but I think it makes a really professional presentation if you need to show this to a decision maker or a dam owner. It, that maybe makes more sense to them than some stick figures. But the 30,000 foot view, I would say, is you go into stream stats, maybe, and delineate your basin. And then you can use that basin to crop to uh, trim uh, a digital elevation model. And then what you see there on that image is that we've buffered, we've extended that shape file so that your HMS model doesn't spill out of just an exact watershed. Um, and if you're you're good with GIS, like, like Anthony, uh, or I, I had Katie Shank help me with some of this, it's, it's really pretty quick. Um, so we're hoping that that supplement will make it quick for anybody else who's interested in doing that. Really for what we're doing right now, this is kind of window dressing it. it gives you a more satellite view of what the basin is. Um, I believe there are, there's a HEC, HM, uh, HEC, what's it called? Geo HMS, I believe out there that you can utilize GIS data to plug into the model and it will assist with ground cover, et cetera, and use it. But in what we're doing right now, all we're doing is denoting the, the basin itself and we brought that in because Anthony knew how to do it. <laughs> so <clears throat> here's a blow up of the window that identifies the basin model itself. And I'm, I'm just use this to show the components within it. So you identify this this basin under the model, the basin model section. And it's made up of a sub basin, which they just call sub one, and then the reservoir, which is basin number two reservoir. This is an actual reservoir that you'll be plugging data in uh, later today. <clears throat> and under uh, sub basin one, it has all these different categories where you can input data. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't even know exactly what this digitization means or canopy or surface. So I've never used it. I don't know if other people have used it, um, but I think it's a way to help identify uh, what the conditions are within the, the basin. The last three are the ones that uh, I use most often, and that's to identify the loss, which is the SCS curve number. The unit hydrograph, and we're going to use the Clark unit hydrograph method to do it. And then the base flow is going to be calculated based on constant monthly uh, base flow. <clears throat> the reservoir, what's not shown there, is a, is a separate window here for the reservoir itself, but it's embedded within that reservoir icon. And then it can identify the spillways and the dam tops, in other words, understanding where the top of the dam actually is. So here's the, <clears throat> once you click on the sub basin, you get a window that looks like this. It's a summary window for it. It has the sub tabs in here that says we're going to input information for loss, transform, base flow. Um, options is not going to really play into this. But within this window, you need to fill out some information like here's the basin area in square mile. <clears throat> um, Anthony and Brett put in the, the location and latitude and longitude, but I don't think that's even necessary. That uh, when you use the terrain file for the delineation, as long as it's projected, those fields automatically populate. Which oh, is I see. another uh, benefit of okay. using the terrain data. Then you can import uh, geo reference. Uh, shape files and stuff and, 
and different things into your model if you want to have it for a visual, if you want to add I got different you. things onto the graph. Okay, thank you. So entering in the, the loss or the, the infiltration factor, the curve number in this particular one, we only used one subbasin, so the subbasin covered the entire basin, and we calculated an average curve number for that entire basin. Now, if you had larger basins, you would break it up into subbasins and identify curve numbers for each one of those subbasins. Um, in this particular example, we're letting the, the computer calculate initial abstraction, so we're leaving that blank. And in this particular basin, there's no impervious areas. You would fill out impervious areas. There were large rock areas and um, and probably reservoirs too, right? I think reservoirs are part of the impervious. Yeah, definitely not a small basin. Sometimes the reservoir can be, you know, a meaningful. significant portion of it, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so how does it calculate the initial abstraction? Is that the NRCS? Uh, so if you look at the, the Calculations that the NRCS or SCS came up with for doing that. So they calculate Q, which is based on storage, with and they calculate and Q is based on inches coming out of the basin. They take a portion of that Q and or the storage and they calculate the initial abstraction for it. So they're linked together. Yeah. So it's a, it's based on soil type. One thing I would add, and I, I would love to hear how others approach this, um, there, there was a small percentage of this basin that, that did come back as impervious area. Um, however, I just created a weighted curve number for the entire basin, and so that percentage that is impervious is factored into the, the weighted curve number, and that seemed easier to me than um, doing it in, you know, adding the impervious percentage there in, in that. So, so you don't, I don't, I didn't change the impervious percentage at all in the HMS model, but it's, it's baked into the weighted curve number. How much was that, Brent? How much was the impervious? It's very, it's a very small percentage. This basin was like 93% evergreen forest. I was less than 1% that was impervious, but okay. yeah, it, it did, um, there was a small area that was impervious, and then it listed water separately. So I would use a curve number of 98 for both of those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Jerry, one more thought there that just came to my mind, and I don't I don't really have an answer here on this or, or anything. Uh, just kind of a thought is if there were to be like a wildfire within the basin, and they say that the, the wildfires can kind of really reduce infiltration, um, how would what would you think would be a, a means for approaching that? Does anyone have any thoughts? For, would you would you consider a wildfire area to be impervious? Or so one thing that we've done is um, <clears throat> in post burn conditions like that, bumped up the curve number to like depending on the conditions, it burns very to somewhere between ninety three and ninety eight. Okay, um, it makes it almost entirely run off. Sure, um, and that's assuming. Know, first year after the burn that the storm would come through um, and then over time you'd have to re-establish your curve number um, based on how much vegetation has come back and how much if there's a uh, there can be a hydrophobic layer underneath the soil after a burn that can create more runoff okay um, in the first year or two till it gets broken up um, and uh, depending on the characteristics of that you can Fiddle with your curve number. The uh, Forest Service has a, a paper that has some guidance on that. And then there's a bunch of um, uh, research that's been done by different universities that also provides context for trying to select um, curve numbers. For right, based on where you're at, Montana versus I found a really California good, versus really good paper by the NRCS for service, but there's quite a range, you know, uh, but uh, at least you've got some pretty good guidance out yeah. there for what curve numbers. And, and what Carl and I kind of looked at, because we, we 
kind of needed to do this to appease the Forest Service on some other dams that we're working on. And um, it really depends on the severity of the fire and how you determine that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You have There's to have some knowledge for... related to whether it was a real hot burn or not. Okay. I have no idea how that is but identified. You think that it's the the probably the, the best approach there is to use that in weighting the curve number and not consider that to be an impervious area. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's okay. yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And you so, may weight it differently in different areas based on different conditions. So how does this percent impervious work? If I was that comment that somebody made about including the impervious area in the average is how I would have done it. So if you weren't doing it that way, if you want to put in a percent impervious, you would count the impervious as something else first, or I guess I'm not exactly sure how the computer uses that number. If you had a number in there, I I I don't quite know either. I what I it assumes that there is absolutely no infiltration. Big runoff. So I don't know if it handles it by assigning a, a curve number of 100 for that area or whether it. Yeah, but, I, I okay, but, but, but what area? You're not putting it oh, for the whole area? No. For a percentage of the area? Oh, yeah. well. And then it reweights it? I think, well, Brent, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think what you did is you, you said there was a small impervious percentage within the basin. What what did you assign, what kind of curve number did you assign to that area then to come up with an average? Yeah, so I, I, I think that SES guidance is to assign a curve number of 98 for impervious areas. And the way that I got, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if we're gonna talk about this later, but um, the way that I came up with that is the national land cover I can't remember if it's a Saturday database, but um, you can pull that. It's it's commonly used to in like HECRAS 2D models to assign your man and Zen value over a large study area. But you can go um, online. This, is, this I know this will be in the guidance document, um, but you can pull your area of interest and get that national land cover data set. And it will, you know, if you do a little bit of manipulation in GIS, it'll say, so for basin number two, our drainage area is like 4.9 square miles, and it will spit out, you know, what your percent imperviousness is based on that national land cover data set classification. And the way that I came up with this curve number is I weighted based on land cover, and then I double weighted again based on that hydrologic soil group. Does that... Does that make make sense? And we we've been talking about fires, so I, I'll add too that um, there's a lot of beetle kill in this area. Talking with butte silver bow folks, so I, I chose um, kind of poor conditions. I think when you're selecting based on that, is that helpful? I, I think so. So you were saying that you assigned the. A, a curve number for the impervious areas when you calculated an average? Yeah. Curve yeah. number? 98. That makes sense? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I understand what he did. I just don't understand if we hadn't done it that way and put a number in that impervious, what the computer does with that exactly. It's 100% yeah, effective precipitation if you have a number in there. And does it subtract that? from the area over which this is calculated, you mean? Like subtract that area out? Yeah, subtract that area out and apply that curve number to what's left and then put the 100 in there for, or the 100% precip in there then for that percentage. So you have to check that. Yeah, 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 that. So yeah I don't know. Obviously, that's, that's your assignment. <laughs> Report back to the group after lunch. <laughs> Gary, I might just add back to on the burn watershed hydrology. Uh, State of Washington has done a lot of research into that, and 
dam safety protocols for a burned watershed. Plus, it, Martin Walther, I don't know if you remember him, he's a long time, I think he's retired now. Um, but I can look up those references and maybe put them in the OneDrive for, okay. for people to download. Sure. But yeah, they've done a, a lot of work, most work of any state on that. Mm -hmm. Transform uh, is HMS's term for a hydro, I'm sorry, a unit hydrograph. <clears throat> um, and in this particular case, we'll, we'll talk about this, why we're using the Clark unit method, Clark's unit hydrograph method. Um, it's really easy to calculate this. Um, there was a study that the USGS put out that actually identified unit hydrograph parameters for Montana. And they divided it into uh, sites that are in the plains and in the mountains. And it's up to the user to decide which is the, the appropriate one. But all it's based on is the basin area. So if you plug in the basin area, it will calculate the time of concentration and the storage carb coefficient are for that particular basin. Base flow, um, I, I've been using uh, the uh, constant month, monthly uh, method of doing that, meaning that if you can come up with a reasonable estimate of what the flow rate might be for a particular month and plug that in in the way that we got this was to go into stream stats for this basin, and they calculate these flows for you based on the gauge data in the region. <clears throat> so you can see that in the winter months, it's very low. In May and June, they are absolutely the highest, okay? And then they taper off again. Um, couldn't tell you if that's reasonable or not. And I don't know how you would determine if it is unless you have some sort of gauge data for a particular, bit, particular basin. But this is what it, it, it gives. Now, the thing that you'll see, it, like I said, in the real frequent storms, five, 10 year return periods, um, and you simulated in May, it could be a significant part of the hydrograph that is coming into the reservoir itself. So um, just need to be aware of that. But that's really how we're, we're going at it. And, and does anybody else have any other good ideas for coming up with that? If you don't have gauge data. Well, it's always good to go out and look at it. Well, you could. Take your Marsh McBurney and do a little measurement out there. But one thing about stream stats is and I don't know about this data. I assume it wouldn't give you this data if you were regulated. You know what I mean by that? When you have a reservoir or right. since 10 Mile Creek is the one I like to use for my classic care of, but the problem is it's because the city of Helena diverts all the water off of Red Mountain. It won't give me information for 10 Mile Creek right. right? because more than 20% of the base is regulated. And so there's just a, and I've run into that time and time again in a lot of places in Montana where it won't give me the data I want because there's just so there's much regulation of our watersheds. Yeah, and, and by the, regulation, you mean dams or diversions or something. Something that's out yeah, of keeping the water out yeah. of it. Yeah. In the case of 10 Mile Creek, you could use gauge data, right? Yeah, yeah, you sure could. So if there's a gauge nearby. Right. Yep. Carrie, it looks like somebody put something in the chat. I don't know. Uh, what am I going to do now? Oh, that was that was just me. I I looked up the HMS manual and what it says about the impervious area. I can read it since you guys in the room probably have a small screen. Uh, percentage of the subbasin, which is directly connected impervious area, can be specified. No loss calculations are carried out on the impervious area. 
all precipitation on that portion of the sub basin becomes excess precipitation and subject to surface storage and direct runoff. That kind of lays out how it would approach that calculation if you specify the percentage and purpose. Okay. So they treat it separately from the other parts of the basin. Yes, I think the key is just don't don't do both. Choose one. <laughs> Thank you. Up with the reservoir, it seems like you kind of want that to be, you know, impervious percentage the reservoir itself, because certainly there's no initial abstraction or anything from that. I'm not sure what happens if if you adjust the curve numbers, you know, to reflect that percentage. The, You'd have to work through that to see if that's correct or not. I don't right. Yeah. But what you're saying is you need to separate that that out, that impervious area out. That's how I've always done it, yes. Yeah. An even better way would be to make separate sub area because you have a concentration that is just going to be totally different for the rain or the reservoir than it is for the basin. Yeah. All right. So identifying the components that are associated with the reservoir. Uh, <clears throat> this is the the component tree on the left. Um, and for this particular reservoir there are two spillways. This this dam was actually partially breached and created a, a lower spillway. And then it has its normal emergency spillway associated with it as well. And then you have, here's the information that would go into dam tops. Now, when you click on this reservoir, the tab that comes up shows all of the information that's there. And, and you can drill down into each one of those. But what it's identifying is that the elevation storage function is that file there that's part of the time series. Um, I'm sorry, the paired data file <clears throat> that's associated with it. It asks for initial elevation. In other words, what's the starting elevation of the reservoir when you start the simulation? Um, and then what else do we have? Oh, the, the, the method for the uh, spillway, the, they used was outflow structures um, up at the top. Okay. <clears throat> we go to the paired data, which is part of the tree down here, or in the in the, the the component tree. The two main things we have are elevation storage to identify the reservoir, and then elevation discharge that identifies the spillway. And in this case, we have the two spillways that are shown there. If you were to go to the elevation storage, you enter the data in as in tab tabular form. On the left is elevation, and on the right is the storage in acre feet. <clears throat> um, I don't show the whole thing here. I uh, couldn't get it in the in the window, but um, that's all you do. So from some outside source, you're getting that information as far as what the elevation storage um, information is for the, for, for the dam. If we were to look at a spillway, this is the emergency spillway. Now we're looking at elevation and discharge. <clears throat> and again, you have to have that information identified somewhere outside of the program here that you plug into this table. Okay, <clears throat> so the spillway is really the outflow out of the, the reservoir as you run your simulation. Okay. Meteorological model at the top is the component tree. And I'm just gonna show some information here related to the 10 year return period. So if you click on this meteorological model that's called 10 year, you get this information that comes in this particular table down here. 
um, is going to come from a specific hiatus graph that you input into the, the program itself. Um, it does have the capability to generate storms based on the SES, say like a type two storm or something like that. It can do that for you if, if you so desire. But we feel we have data uh, that helps in identifying these hiatus graphs that's very specific to Montana. And, and that's kind of what we're using. And we'll find out what those are here later. <clears throat> um, this is the thing that Mike was talking about that I pointed out. Um, within this meteorological model, there's a tab called basins. And uh, I can tell you how many times I've run the program and I get errors and I cannot figure out what's wrong. But all I needed was to put in here a yes to, um, to include the sub basins on it. Um, so, but it is important to remember that. And that's why I pointed it out specifically for this because it's been a head scratcher for me many times. And it's like, when will you learn? And <clears throat> Sometimes I remember it, sometimes I don't. <clears throat> the specified hiatus graph, <clears throat> if you uh, go to here, it'll ask you what that hiatus graph is. And when you go to the gauge, they, they call the, the um, time series data a gauge. Um, it, when you click on that box, it will give you a drop down menu of all the gauges that are available. And for this one, we picked the 10 year storm for this particular one, but it would also have these hiatus graphs or gauges in there as well that you can choose from. And when you go to your time series and you pick out that gauge that's up there, it will show this information down here. I, I, Late last night, I discovered that I hadn't shown a window like this, so I put it in, but I've got a 25 year thing here. The reason I show it <clears throat> is because when you click on this window for the gauge, you identify the time interval. And in this particular one, we're doing one hour. Um, <clears throat> but you have the, uh, the ability to change that time window. Um, but that identifies the, um, the input parameters and the time steps within that, uh, that gauge or time series data. So uh, this is the time window that they identified. Here are the dates. Um, and, and the only reason that uh, a year would matter is if you're identifying an exact storm that you're downloading into that. Um, but we are identifying that it is happening in the month of May. And that is intentional because we're looking at that period of time where um, it would be most likely for uh, a larger rainstorm to occur. Okay, so that's the time window. And then here's the table itself. <clears throat> so here are the, the time steps and you can see they, they put them in the, the vernacular of a day, month, year, and then the time. And they use a 24 hour clock. Um, as far as time, and you can see that they are in one hour increments over here. And then you input the depth of uh, precipitation in each one of those time increments. So this is another piece of information that you would generate outside of the program and input into it. <clears throat> These are the control specifications here. Where we left off was, we had just talked about meteorological models. And now one of the components you have to input into the program is called control specifications. And this is all it's made up of. Um, and all you're really doing is identifying the time window and then the time interval. And this time interval is the computational time interval. Now, I typically put this at the same interval as the hydrographs and et cetera. You don't have to, it can be different. And it kind of depends on the length of storm. And uh, really what you want to try to do is come as close to a peak discharge in the resulting hydrograph as you can. So uh, <clears throat> we're here, we're modeling a 72 hour storm. So one hour would be probably adequate for this. Uh, but if it was a shorter storm, you may want to pick something that's uh, a shorter time interval. Carrie, just to 
comment on that. I don't I don't know if this applies to the rainfall runoff part, but when I use dam break, H, HMS for dam break modeling, I found you have to use pretty short time intervals or you'll miss the peak, like five to 10 minutes. So um, haven't ex done much with the rainfall runoff part of HMS, but I would guess it would hurt to do a sensitivity analysis to, to make sure that your time interval isn't too big and yeah, you might be missing a, a peak. Yeah. Good, good comment. <clears throat> uh, this top statement isn't true. In, in the case that we're using, it is. Um, and what you'll find is that we're going to use data that takes uh, depth, uh, or I'm sorry, a, a rainfall depth information from a 24 hour storm. But then in the methods that were used that the USGS came up with, they take that depth from a 24 hour storm and spread it out over a 72 hour period. So that's why we're uh, using that in, in this particular case. <clears throat> um, the overall time window here needs to be long enough to encapsulate that 72 hour storm and probably something after it, just so you're assured that you're catching the peak of the resulting hydrograph off the end, um, and one hour time step is appropriate, I think, for a 72 hour storm. Again, it, it, like Michelle suggested, maybe a sensitivity analysis to see what would give you the best uh, estimate of the peak coming out. Uh, let's see. I try to do this, you don't have to. So if you wanna match those time intervals, that's fine. All right, um, so I'm gonna take some time now to talk about data sources. And I, I really feel this is maybe the, the most worthwhile part of this for people who may not be familiar with what we're gonna look at. Yeah. I'm still thinking about your 72 hour storm. Story. Oh, okay. Why is it 72 hours? If we're talking about small events. That's, you know, we looked at that, and that's where we got the highest peak flow coming out for the 72 hour event, even for the smaller storms in a small basin like that. I, I know you would think that in a smaller basin, a shorter, flashier storm would give you a higher peak. But I think compared with the, uh, or when you run it through a reservoir, et cetera, it, Came out to be the longer storm, and it probably has more to do with volume than anything else. So anyway, that's what we're using for that. So these data sources that we're going to look at are we're going to identify some of the information that goes into the basic characteristics. Um, how you come up with reservoir spillway and dam, dam data, and then the rainfall depth and hydrographs that are associated with it. <clears throat> okay. So uh, there are a lot of ways to calculate uh, this. And I think Anthony would probably tell you, well, I, I would rather use a GIS method like we did for terrain, but you can use stream stats to come up with a drainage area. Stream stats, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a program developed by the USGS where you can uh, actually click the downstream portion of a drainage basin and it will calculate the, the drainage area for it and then all the characteristics that go with it, hydrologically speaking. Um, so that's what I used. And I don't know if we compared what I got with what you got on any of this. I think you and Brent maybe had one quick back and forth email about the basin area. Uh, one was doing it was, like 4.85 and it was like 4.91 or something yeah, square miles. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you can get a little bit different, but. Um, Anthony, that, that was just because I typed it in wrong into oh, one, oh, <laughs> one thing. Okay. So. Okay. I I would I in my experience, stream stats is very accurate in most basin delineation, unless you're looking at areas with little relief or. 
And I think that StreamStats probably uses the 30 meter uh, elevation data. Um, and our train model that we built, most of these was the 10 meter elevation data. So there might be some discrepancies there depending on where you, uh, on, on how they delineate. They probably delineate similarly as long as you choose the same downstream point, right? Um, yeah. I think that would be the biggest difference. And, and then we also, I think we're gonna use LIDAR to do a quick delineation uh, this afternoon. And there might be a little bit of difference there just based on, on the terrain resolution. Yeah. Hey, Kathy, do you know if StreamStats uses 10 meter DEM or what it runs on? I don't think it does use the 10 meter. Um, it's based on the NHD version two, the medium resolution NHD. And I think that was the 30 meter, but I'll check to be sure. Thank you. Either one of these are, really, are pretty accurate. And I can tell you that and the uh, elder people here can join me in saying this is much easier than what we used to have to do, where we get out our planimeters and outline on a topo map and then convert into square miles. So um, did anyway. Anybody, did anybody um, paste onto cardboard and balance to find the base in centroid? Of course. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you did. <clears throat> you had to make sure the cardboard wasn't different thickness, though. <clears throat> Soil characteristics. Um, the NRCS has a, a really nice online tool called the Web Soil Survey. And um, <clears throat> when you, the, the only uh, Downfall of this one is that you do have to delineate the basin yourself, I believe. At least that's what I've come to learn. <clears throat> so this shows a, the basin as delineated by whoever ran this analysis. And once it delineates that basin, it identifies the soil within that basin. And you can see that the different colors within the basin represent different soil types. Um, then the nice thing about it is that you can get properties of the soil within that. And one of those properties is that they will give you the hydrologic soil group for that particular soil, which um, then can turn into an aid in determining your curve number. Hey, Gary, your uh, handout from yesterday, one of the appendices showed how you could import from stream stats into the web soil survey. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, who did that? That must have been Brent, I guess. That, that was me. And I, it's um, the web soil survey is a million times easier to use than the national land cover data set. So you can delineate your basin and stream stats, download a shape file, and then you can upload that exact same shape file to the web soil survey and have these data in five or 10 minutes. Um, it's, a, it's really quick and easy. And then okay. at least as far as I was able to tell with the National Land Cover data set, which I think we're gonna talk about, you cannot directly upload a shape file of your watershed. You have to actually pull it into something like Arc Pro and do that work yourself, which is not quite as convenient. Okay, good. Brent, do you need to worry about projections on that? Like in the shape file you download from stream stats, is that, do you have to monkey around with that at all before you can upload it into this? Um, I, I'm not an expert on projections, so I, Anthony's probably the one to ask. I, I will, or, or um, I had Katie Shank help me with a lot of this too. So, but I, I will say that when I, uploaded this space in number two shape file. You can see in the graphic there. Um, I just visually looked at it and it matched right up where we're right on the continental divide. So um, I felt like that was accurate enough to pull the, the data I needed, but I would defer to somebody else on projections. Yeah, when I used the, the web soil survey, you didn't need to, to use the projections on the show. Um, yeah, you can just take the shape file straight out of uh, stream stats that you delineate in. And um, it comes with the shape files are like four sub files. Like, 
as just one's an SHP and then the other one be like SHX DBF and another one and you just bring all four of those in and, and drop it into the web soil survey and then we'll do it. I think it probably gives you a geo tip, which is geo referenced out of stream stats. So you don't need to worry about your projection because it's already a geo reference shape file. Okay. okay. So yeah, short answer is no, it's pretty simple. Okay, because I was really confused by that projection part of when you brought it into HMS, that was really confusing. Yeah, that's yeah, that's about, about the, the edge of my GIS skills. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. At any rate, the, the good thing about it is that it does give you hydrologic soil group for the soil type, and then it delineates the sub areas of each soil types within there, which allows you to then come up with a, a weighted curve number, or <clears throat> we'll, we'll explain here later uh, how you do it, but it ultimately leads to that weighted group number, or uh, curve number. <clears throat> And I may have either Brent or Anthony talk about this a little bit more. I have not used the land cover information, but it uh, looks like it's a pretty good database to identify what that ground cover is. And you can use that in conjunction with the soil data. So yeah, that's um, I, I can start and Anthony can can add anything that I get wrong. But National Land Cover Database is developed by a consortium of federal agencies um, does cover the entire country. And it's a little bit, the only hiccup that I found with it is it's a little bit difficult to find where on their website, if you don't want to download the entire countries, the, uh, you know, a shape file for the entire country, uh, you have to go to a special little viewer page and you can say, well, okay, I, I really only care about this small area south of Butte. Uh, and so that is that is what I did, um, Anthony and, and I did. Uh, so you download your area of interest, and they have classified it uh, into different land covers. You know, so this this basin that we're looking at is predominantly evergreen forest, shrub, scrub, rock, water, uh, pretty typical alpine basin. And so once you have done a little bit of work in Arc Pro or whatever GIS software you want to use, um, you can crop your watershed in this database and, and you know pull out. So you've got a drainage area of 4.9 square miles, and it will break that out into what percent is what land cover. And that was how. I assigned a, a weighted curve number. If I said, okay, for the evergreen forest, I'm going to use this curve number um, and weighted based on that. And then we just talked about the web soil survey and kind of all the soil groups. So I, I incorporated that in, I guess, like a, a double weighting, if you will, um, and came up with a weighted curve number for the basin that way. And then that's what we use to pseudo calibrate. Um, in that. So, so how do you get a curve number just from the cover, the land cover? Yeah. So you've you've got a, um, you know, I I just downloaded it into Excel, and it will say, okay, we've got four point nine square miles, or maybe it's in acres. Whatever, whatever you, however you get it, if it's in acres or, or square miles. It will say this is how much is evergreen forest, and then that's where you, where you as the analyst have to say, okay, based on um, you know what, whatever if you're using SCS publication, this is the curve number that I'm going to assign to anything that's evergreen forest. This is the curve number that I'm going to assign to shrub, scrub, um, and and so on until you have assigned curve numbers to all of your different land covers. I think this is also commonly used like for large HECRAS 2D models where you want to assign Nanny's N values to a large area. You know, you can you can do that 
based on the land cover. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little. So when you go into the curb number table for the NRCS, right. yes, it's got all these land covers listed right. along with hydrologic A, B, C. Right, right. right. You yeah. have to know the soil class of the hydrologic. This tells you what line in the table yep. to go over and grab a number from. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and I find it very intimidating and complex. You use yeah. this? Oh yeah, I tried, but uh, for a lot of drainages like this one that we're talking about today, it's pretty easy. Just you could pull up a topo map, and they color green the areas that are forested, and you could take an area there. Of course, that's really old, right? Yeah. But you'd be amazed how many times I do it both ways. Then I bring up a satellite image, and I do the same thing with just my eyeball and. You'd be amazed how close the okay. GS topo is okay. on uh, a lot of times. But you know, there are other ways of doing it that are a lot less intimidating than trying to find this database profession. Yeah. It's very I, hard hearing the audience. If somebody could repeat something, I I I always when getting curve numbers base it on soil maps, not national land cover databases. At least that's the way the SCS tells you to do it. Well, it has to be both, though. You need to know the hydrologic soil group with the from the soil data. And you also need to know what the land use is or the, or the cover for it. Well, the land use, but that's not the same as the land cover. Well, kind of. Uh, but so I never saw a land cover ever used to determine. The access to the reference table. Table. I don't know if I did. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for now for a second, you guys. Um, oh, well, whatever. Mark, so when you're, when you say you've got TR55 pulled up and it gives you a table and on that left hand side, it'll say, you know, this is row crop, this is forest, this is such and such. And then on the upper right, it says hydrologic soil. Group. There, you can we, close that. That's just the outlook calendar. Down. Right, which is that's, that's why I think you need both. You can't assign a curve number based just on the soil type. You, you need that land yeah. cover and the soil type. Okay. You know, and then obviously we're going we're gonna to pseudo calibrate it and or, or whatever method we're using, but you know, we're not going to stop with that very first estimate of the curve number. That's, that's how I this yeah. kind of steps back, and I apologize, but when you're doing the precipitation, I kind of just glossed over that, um, how you came up with those tables. Did you use the NOAA 2 Atlas um, grid data for that? Okay. It's, it's the, um, we use the method from technical note one. From what? The Try, uh, safety technical note that. one. So that that's all. So we're not using the updated information that's available out there. Yeah. This is all going to become obsolete here in a few years. Has anybody tried using the grid data that's available now? And this is worth talking the, about. The grid model is available on the radar. And no, I'm staying out of my spec model. I, uh, where am I now? That one there. Right yep. here. <clears throat> so this is out of TR55. So this is what you're referring to, right? This table. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, that is what you use. <clears throat> so, Brent, maybe. Step us through where how you do this. Of course, this is urban areas. I think there's a there there's should be another table further down. Yeah. There's agriculture. Under right. So it, it doesn't it doesn't include you know every everything that you would encounter. So I, I think there's some engineering judgment. Yeah. I I chose based on the cover type on the left. So whichever one of these uh, you think is most representative 
for an evergreen forest. Um, one table and, and as it turns out, this basin is 93% evergreen. That's the only one I even changed during pseudo calibration. So, so did you get your ABCD groups from the soil from, survey? Yep, from the web soil survey, because you, you need- yeah, that, That's how it's- I, I, you, need, you need both of those. Um, and I believe that because, uh, I, I would have to look at my spreadsheet, but we talked about there's a lot of beetle kill um, and kind of poor condition. So I think that initially I chose uh, poor condition for, you know, maybe, maybe the woods curve numbers. And then also used that soil group data from the web soil survey. Hey, Brett. Yeah. You, you trail off a little bit. It's hard to hear you on some of the stuff you're saying. If you could maybe get a little closer or something. <laughs> Project into this this tiny little laptop. Um, yes. So I used from the National Land Cover data set. Used the I used that to get the cover type, which is on the left there. Uh, then the hydrologic soil group comes from the Web Soil Survey. And lastly, because Talking with Butte Silverbow folks, there's quite a bit of beetle kill um, and, and poor conditions up there. I think I chose the curve numbers under that poor condition, under that poor hydrologic condition. So incorporated both of those data sources. And that, you know, I, I think Anthony actually did just estimate, um, you know, the cover for one of the models that he worked on, and that and it worked out great. But this this seems defensible to me. If if I were to be challenged on this, I can say no. I used national land cover data set, and I used web soil survey, and here's here's why I did it. Thank you, Brent. That clarifies it. That's that's what I remember doing many years ago. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Brent would have done that for each little area and then done a weighted average to come up with a composite right. curve number. Right. Exactly. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. One one other thing here, Gary. Uh, this the poor bear good. This uh, condition, the hydrologic condition that it describes here. I yeah. have some descriptors down at the bottom that talks about you know what how to classify that um, depending on how that land has been used um, and what the ground cover characteristics are. So, like for pasture, whether it's heavily grazed or not heavily grazed. Or, uh, for width, if it's um, got good understory or, or not. Um, so that that is not something that's going to be in the either of those resources. So it's something that you're going to have to make a decision on as an engineer. And yeah. if you've been there, then that's better. <clears throat> or if you have told us. And I think in what Brent was saying is since there was so much beetle kill there, he, he picked poor as far as... And one more thing to mention is that uh, along with this table, the NRCS also has the antecedent moisture condition table to adjust your curve numbers based upon whether or not you think it's been dry or it's been wet. Right. And uh, well, that's an important thing to remember when you get to the calibration phase is that uh, you didn't mention that in your paper, but you can use you can use that to calibrate as well. Uh, true. You know, as justification for <clears throat> moving your curve number to, to give you a calibration. Yeah. Okay. Good point. I do forget <coughs> about it. See moisture content. Okay. And the other thing that may be good just to remember is that the curve number approach in general is taking a whole lot of if you look back at the water budget, the hydrologic budget, you've got precip, which is your input, but then you've got infiltration, evaporation, interception, cooling. You've got all these places where water comes out of the equation, and we're lumping all of that together into one little number that we call the curve number. That's a particularly important point. When you get all said and done, it's good to look at what your actual effective precipitation rate is. That is what percent of the uh, 
little rainfall is actually coming off. Yeah. yeah. You can easily wind up with a lot of rainfall disappearing from the model, which uh, might not be appropriate. Yeah. How would you test that, though? I mean, how would you? Well, without having rainfall data and gauge data, how do you? How do you? I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm just. Wondering. Well, I would. I break it apart yeah. into its pieces and do some quick calculations of the pieces and make sure it makes sense in my. I, you know, this year when I taught hydrology, I was constantly challenging the students not just to accept what the computer gives you, but to actually do some extra work to justify it outside of that. Because it gets a little scary to me when we just, especially the stream stats and stuff, they just throw out numbers to you and just go, oh, well, stream stats says it's true. It must be true yeah. in your mind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What I think you pointed it out to me, I didn't realize is that the equation, and Kathy, you can chime in on this, but this, the, the regression equations for stream stats now includes things like evapotranspiration. Is that true? But it includes solar radiation, which again, trying to verify that number. Yeah. So there's a NASA webpage that they give to do it, but I wasn't able to find it. Well, wouldn't that be dependent on season and oh, day yeah. and all sorts, of, all sorts of things? Yeah. Kathy, I don't know if you have any comments on that. So, right, the, I think in some for some hydrologic regions, it does include evapotranspiration. Basically, they just um, threw everything into the regression to see which popped out as being important for a particular hydrologic region. So, yes, in some cases, they did include that. Um, evapotranspiration. I'll have to look at the solar radiation data and where it's from. But um, again, it's it depends by re it goes region by region what ended up being important. And I did see that land That's cover. That's eastern Montana, if I remember right. Just the uh, well, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. So I did look at what's available on stream stats, and some land cover classes are available there. Again, I think because they found it was important for regression in some places. So like percent um, wetlands, percent crops and hay. If you if you delineate the basin and stream stats, you'll get some land cover information there. Okay. But it's important to note that in my day, those numbers weren't in there. We, we did, we did. <laughs> we did our regressions based on simple things that we could physically measure. Physically measure, right? And now they've got things in there that make it more accurate, but at the same time, it's really hard to independently verify. Yeah, the the data out there that we have now available are amazing. And um, for instance, in Wyoming, we, we're looking at eighty eight potential basin characteristics. Oh my word. <laughs> And we might add more. <laughs> and you know, once we do the regression, we'll hone in on, on a few of those, but still. Or if we if we use instead of regression, use machine learning, for instance, we could end up just throwing everything in there. And then it'll be really fun to verify that. Well, it would make it much harder to verify from the complaint you talked about. If you're getting things that are reasonable. Interesting. I'm learning all kinds of tricky stuff today. Okay, well, we. Great. I think I can see you now. Oh, okay. um, <clears throat> we've been talking about this already, but in order to get the, the curve number, you need a hydrologic soil group and you need some sort of ground cover or land use associated with it. Um, <clears throat> the moisture condition can play in that. That's what, like what Mike was talking about. Also, the good, fair, poor hydrologic conditions, et cetera. Um, the table that I showed there is off of another SES publication for areas that sometimes I've used, depending on what the conditions are, but that's another way to come up with it. But it, the lines represent uh, the different soil groups and then we have 
for same ground cover and at, at the bottom, and you can come up with the curve number from that. <clears throat> anyway, here's a web link to one of those publications from the SCS. Unit ideographs. So, <clears throat> what I've been using is a, a publication that USGS did a, a number of years ago. Um, it was authored by Steve Hollenbeck, which uh, many of you might know. He's uh, he was worked for DNRC and USGS, but he came up with this publication to determine uh, unit hydrographs for large floods in, in Montana. Um, <clears throat> so this is the link to, to the publication itself that's shown on the on the top on the right side there. I want to move that. <clears throat> and then there's also uh, spreadsheets that have been developed to easily plug in values and come up with that. And that's shown on the bottom. And you can link to these spreadsheets through the DNRC Dam Safety website um, and use that uh, as well. Uh, the publication looks at uh, mainly two methods. One is the Clark unit hydrograph method and the other is the dimensionless unit hydrograph method. And um, I don't have a recommendation. I, I default to the Clark unit hydrograph because it's easy to use. I don't know if anybody has any preferences as far as that is concerned, but um, yeah, Michelle. Well, there's a couple of reasons to use the Clark. First of all, if you need to calibrate, it's there's actually parameters in that method that you can use to, I should say, pseudo calibrate your model, whereas the dimensionless doesn't have anything that you can use to calibrate on. And um, and I don't know a lot about why the dimensionless might not be applicable, but Jay Tom, who's looked into this quite a bit, says there's there's some reasons that we should not be using that. And I don't know what those are, but he, he advised avoiding using the dimensional issue hydrograph. Yeah. Uh, Rob, do you have any feedback? I, I think it, a lot of it had to do with the small sample size used in this report. Okay. You know, there's a relatively small number of basins that were used to develop those regressions. And if you can pull up the chart, it's kind of interesting to look at where they show the data points and the scatter. And it's worth being aware of the uh, R squared value for, for the two parameters of the Clark or the two parameters of, of the dimensional issue hydrograph. Uh, usually the peaking parameter, I think time of concentration has a, a pretty decent R squared, as I recall. It's in that little table there, I believe. Um, oh. It might be. Um, whereas the R parameter has a very poor R squared. Then the other thing I've never, I, I kind of uh, like R for the reasons you, you've said, but I also kind of like the other one. I don't know if there's kind of a preference one way or the other, but one thing to be aware of is the Clark has another curve in the background. And it's called a time area curve or something that was developed, I believe, in the Midwest somewhere. I've always wondered how if, if that's relevant or not, because that is part of the method. But by practice, you never mess with that, or I've never seen anybody mess with that. So okay. <clears throat> Anyway, the other thing that is kind of nice about it is that it is based on Montana data. And um, like I said before, you have to make a choice whether your site is in what they call the plains or in the mountains, and it's a judgment call. Usually it's pretty obvious of where, where you are as far as that's concerned, but that would dictate uh, different values for these based on the regression equations that they came up with. But anyway, this is pretty widely used, as you can tell, and um, I think it's a good, good thing to have. Um, this is the printout from StreamStat for average monthly flow for a basin. Um, and man, I, I don't know how they calculate this. Um, I, I don't know. Obviously, it came from regional gauge data, and then they take that and <clears throat> transform it into whatever basin you're, you're actually looking at. Uh, and Kathy, I don't know if you have any feedback on this as well, but 
this is what I plugged into the base flow um, table that was there. And um, you can see that when we ran, ran it, um, it was in, during the month of May. So the, the base flow was a little over 10 CFS. Right, I think this is directly, these are just stats that are correct, calculated by regression equations from stream okay. stats. All right. So um, somebody already mentioned the caution that if you have a regulated basin, it's with Yeah, right. Only thing I will, will add is that the independent variables for these regression equations, uh, I think we're in the Southwest region, are the drainage area and the percentage of the basin above 6,000 feet. Did I get that right, Kathy? Yeah, I think so. I'd have to, to look to refresh my memory. And there is some issue if you're close to that threshold um, for the Southwest region. I don't know if anybody else has other methods to, to, to do that. Um, I said, when I have run storms that are big, very large storms, I just throw in a couple CFS here because it was such a minor portion of it. But when we're talking about these smaller storms, this can make up a significant portion of the hydrograph. So um, just need to be aware of that. Well, I might add that you, in one of our meetings, you showed a, a picture, or Brent showed a picture of the, of this, this drainage of this dam flowing, and it looks about right. I mean, it, yeah, it, it did. Um, it was coming over the, the crest of that uh, breach spillway. Yeah, it looked like it was, could have been close to 10 CFS or so. So maybe that's Based one way on to verify it. Visual knowledge of the flow detection. Yeah. <clears throat> Even if there's not a gauge at the site, if you have that operational data from the dam, you know, depending on who the owner is, yeah, that would be that's another, true. Yeah. another data source. Yeah, if they're uh, recording that data, that comes in handy. Sure. What what is this site that we're using? Okay, so I don't know. Maybe Brandon or Michelle you can talk about this a little bit. Maybe we should have done this a little earlier, but I I'm gonna give a, more of an overview on basin number two before we start our example problems. But it's a small reservoir south of Butte um, with a drainage area of about 4.9 square miles. And I'll I'll do more more intro before we all actually start working on the HMS models. It, it's owned by the Butte Silver Bow. It's, it, it's part of their watershed for their water supply. Had a lot of gold in it. When I was there. What's that? It didn't have gold in it, no, or it, it did. Had, it had a lot of gold. In it. Well, well, this they would let me take in samples. Oh, one of the slides up, I'll mention one other thing for the whole method for the you know the high frequency storm. You mentioned pool level restrictions and such. But another time you would do this is during a uh, if you're replacing a spillway and you're looking for you know some kind of appropriate uh, construction drawdown to ensure safety of the dam for you, you know you obviously can't use a PMF or anything like that. You have to select some sort of high frequency storm. And having establishing a reasonable, you know, expected base flow condition it is good for that. Something like this seems appropriate. And, you know, in that case, you might be, in the case of a construction project, you might be doing it in August or September. So you might use something like this in that case to, you know, use flows that are appropriate for that season. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Part of the reason that I, I say this about, it, especially like in May or June, when they're, and Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but these mean flows are taking into account all the high flows that could have occurred over the period of record that they're talking about, right? So you're taking this average flow that could in, in, in include some of these larger flows, and then you're adding to it a hydrograph or a storm. So I think it builds in some conservatism into the whole thing so anyway yes I, as far yeah you, so this is the for instance that may mean flow is just average a regression equation that's based on data from somewhere in that region of all right. may flows. yeah mean flows not maximum but mean okay. 
<clears throat> and I don't have a lot here. It's so if you're trying to identify the the parameters that would give you the stage storage or elevation storage for reservoir uh, spill weight capacity. Most of the time that's going to come from the owner of the dam. You, there should be records available for that. I just threw these graphs up here because they are <clears throat> were based on the basin number two reservoir. Um, but th that is something that um, you will need. Um, it, it, you can generate it. Uh, you know, there we've worked with a lot of reservoirs that did not have anything like this. So we developed, you know, there are methods where you can look at the, I'll say the slopes of the, the side hills coming into the, the reservoir and extrapolating out and knowing what the bottom of the reservoir is and coming up with uh, a volume that way. There's also in the rules, what's the equation? It's 0.4 times the height of the dam times the area. Surface area. Surface area. So you can come up with, you could try to come up with information on your own. With the spillway, um, we've uh, you know we've calculated the the uh, stage discharge relationship of the spillway using heck wraps um, and evaluating that. And you don't even need that. You could use a if the spillway is appropriate and it looks like it's flowing over a crest. You could use uh, a weir equation, a broad crested weir. Or, or anything that might help define that. Okay, but most of the time, most dams that have been established have this information for them. So, any other comments for that? <clears throat> All right, rainfall. So I, again, these are uh, this is generated off of two studies that the USGS did back in 1997 and 1998. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think Mike and I were in dam safety at that time, or, we, or maybe it was Michelle and I, I can't remember, but we, we commissioned the USGS to, to do these, the, these studies in, in order to, uh, the, the impetus behind it was to come up with risk-based dam safety standards. <clears throat> so in this study, they took uh, gauge data from around the world, or the, I'm sorry, the state of the world, and and manipulated it, and I can't even start to describe how they actually did this, but they were able to come up with very uh, high return period um, rainfall events here, up to 5,000 years, which seems almost impossible, but based on the statistical analysis they did, that's what they came up with, and I don't know if you guys have any Background behind that. I know the whole background behind that. Yeah, a guy by the name of Mel Schaefer in Washington right. was the one that first introduced it. And when I saw it, I brought it to Lawrence and said, oh man, this could be a game changer. And we took it to the legislator that year and they shot us down. But right at the end, some political things happened. And the well, it's because we talked about Oh, you cost of repairs. You, you did it. That's right. Cost of repairs for a dam in his district. It was yeah, Francis Barno. There you go. That's the name I was looking for. And we said if you didn't change the standards, it'd cost you ten million dollars yeah. to repair this. And he says, "Okay, it passes." <laughs> so it went through committee. So, but the basic idea is that for any given rainfall site. It only sees a fraction of the storms that pass over the state. So, if you had a way of combining data from different rainfall sites, you could actually generate thousands of years of data, or at least hundreds of years, and turn that into thousands of year projections. So, that's basically the theory behind it. But they also developed then these, these curves that go down to very frequent storms as well. Um, <clears throat> so this is the name of the publication and the, here's the website if you wanna take a look at it. And again, um, developed these spreadsheets that are available through Dam Safety that takes this information 
then you can calculate it using that rather than having to hand calculate it out of the publication itself. It becomes very handy. <clears throat> but this particular one only calculates the rainfall depth. And they've broken the state into three regions. And uh, in general, it's region one is on the west side, region two is in the middle, and region three is on the eastern part of the state. Um, and then they base these equations to come up with these this depth based on those, where, whatever region they are in and the data that's available for it. Okay, so that calculates the depth. So question on that, Gary, I, and, and maybe Kathy can weigh in too. So NOAA Atlas 14 is not available for Montana. Um, and NOAA Atlas 2 was, is too out of date to use. I know I heard Mark bring that up. And so um, the recommendation of the Extreme Storm Working Group was to not use NOAA Atlas 2. So this is all we have, but when NOAA Atlas 14 comes out, would this, I mean, would this no longer be applicable? I mean, we'd still need it for the, the extreme storm, the 5,000 year storm. So. How, how high of a storm is no Atlas? I just pulled up their website. It looks like it goes to 1,000. 1,000? Oh, okay. Ooh. Yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's what I thought. And that's, and that's in the works right now. They are developing NOAA Atlas 14 for Montana. As well as oh, other are. states. So why? Is yes. Two out of three. I can't answer that question. That was something the extreme pre storm working group. I think it's 1952 data or something. Like Precepts changing. Yeah, the rainfall was different back then. <laughs> I I don't know the answer to that. I just know that was a recommendation of the working group to not use it to use this data. <clears throat> I don't think there's anything preventing it from going into Atlas too and picking up rainfall values for it. For I still do. You know, in the Atlas 14, it will be complete for Montana. Yeah, they, did you hear that? Do you know when Atlas 14 is going to be available for Montana? No, I don't. I, I know that they finally funded the work, that, but I don't know how long it's supposed to take. My understanding is at least a couple of years out. Um, okay. And, and when we get those, again, you can use rainfall grid and you don't have to. That's where you, Gary, I think you mentioned one time, heck DSS, and I was confused with DSS wise, but you have to use heck DSS to, to get the data into a way that heck HMS can use it. Um, I just tried downloading that we do have the grids available for HEC2 uh, or for um, no Atlas 2. No Atlas 2. But again, it's like what, 1972 or something. I don't know. It's, it's a ways back. So it's dated. And like Michelle said, that's why they came up with this and in the interim. Um, I think we have to use that spreadsheet that you you're showing well well and the other part of this though for, as far as this publication is concerned is that what was the maximum storm that no atlas 2 gave no atlas 2 what you can download now is a 100 year six hour 100 you know they they, they have different things but i think from that you can calculate um, so you got 100 year 24 hour 100 year six hour Two year 24 hour and two year six hour. That's what you can get from the grid, but then you can, then you can put it in a spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And I think one of the things that, that we were trying to do when we, these studies were done was to get storms that could, that were at a much higher return period. You know, and we're, like I said, this goes up to a 5,000 year, which I can't look at in the right house too. Anyway, that's the depth. Then there was a second uh, publication that gave procedures for identifying the um, hiatus graph for these storms. And um, if you go through the publication, it's extremely complicated on looking at 
uh, they, they looked at different um, ranges of severity, I, I guess is one term that, that they use that would achieve a more a, a conservative hiatograph versus a non-conservative hiatograph. But all we've done is use the 50%, which would be the average hiatograph that would occur in a particular area. So they analyzed the storms in each one of these regions and looked at the distribution of rainfall and then came up with shapes that matched the storms that were statistically possible within a particular region. <clears throat> um, and in this one, um, this is where they did, and I, I'm not sure I fully understood the whole basis behind it, and somebody can help me with it, but if you generate a 24-hour depth from the first publication, it plugs into a hydrograph that they spread out over 72 hours. So they have what they call a kernel value of depth within that 72 hour period. Um, I'm not sure, quite sure why. I, and I know with a uh, six hour storm, I think it's a 24 hour period. Um, and then did they have a two hour? I'm trying to remember. But they spread that out. Uh, I, and I don't know the basis behind it, but I think it had to do with trying to capture precipitation on either side of that particular storm, mostly on the, the downstream side or the, the after effects. I, I don't really know. <clears throat> At any rate, it generates these hiatographs. And again, there are spreadsheets to help that. The, the result, if, if you use that spreadsheet, will be a tabular form that says time versus depth, incremental depth. And that's what you plug into FHMS in a time series uh, rain gauge uh, file. And I think with the 24 hour storm, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it is over 72 hour period. The depth is for the 24, and there's additional depth to get those tails to get out there. The is. Hours. Yes. And then old school, when you would, you know, put it into before this publication existed, when you developed the hydrograph, you'd pick a point in time, either right in the center or in the USBR. Flood hydrology manual, it was at the two thirds point where the peak occurred. Right. And and that's kind of for reservoirs more conservative because you have more of the storm in front to uh, build up storage in the reservoir. But this procedure is um, intended to be more uh, accurate for Montana and more typical. Uh, right. And so it'll tends to be more front loaded. The peak will tend to be more earlier. Um, it won't be as far back as the two thirds right. point for most or maybe in all of the parts of Montana. Yeah. Be more front loaded. And, and there's nothing saying that the user can't plug into you know, a hydrograph with the shape that you talked about with the peak at two thirds of the time value. Um, but because this was generated with actual data within those regions, this is what we've been using. I'm really not familiar with this. Um, I don't know if anybody else, Anthony, or you, you know Prism very well. What I do know is that this was de developed by the University of, or I'm sorry, Oregon State University, and it takes it, it takes uh, a an aerial view of rainstorms. And right, and you can go back to a certain period of time and look at an area that you know has a storm, and it will show you the hiatograph for that particular storm at that point. So, right. So my understanding, and I, I don't know if this is going to make it clearer or less clear, uh, of Prism data is it's a gridded precipitation data that's, like you said, produced by Oregon State. Um, and it's largely, it seems to be largely based off of radar. And then they take those different radar points around the grid and then they use that as model input to spatially distribute um, the precip because they have the, the temporal distribution from the, the radar and the gauges. Um, and then they use those data to kind of essentially fill in the rest of the map around the gauges. 
So you have a, a spatial representation of your storms. Um, and then it, it has a, a temporal distribution, usually in like a one hour or a six hour interval. So you'll have a, a grid for that one hour in time for uh, the entire country. Uh, and you would go in and you would try and identify when there was a, a large storm event at your site. And then you would grab the prism data uh, for your site uh, spatially during that, that time frame. And then you could import the grid of data into HMS uh, as essentially several different slices of time uh, for the same location, having different precipitation values for individual grid cells. Okay. Um, and I'll just add one thing if I can. This is David Ketchum from Water Management Bureau. Um, the pr PRISM and GridMet are trying to also account for topographic influences on precipitation. So especially in mountainous regions, you'll see a big difference in the amount of precipitation you get between the mountains and the valley bottoms. And it's one of the products that take into account a lot of different topographic and geographic influences on the amount of precipitation that occurs. And so they're trying to cover that uh, to hopefully get a more realistic basin scale a uh, volumetric estimate of, of precipitation compared to inverse distance weighting, for example, which wouldn't take into account the terrain features in between weather stations. But the main purpose is to recreate historical storms. Is that right? Yeah, so, yeah there, there, I don't think there's any sort of gridded precipitation forecasting data right. where they're, they're, they're not predicting right. storm events. They, they just have... <clears throat> Their model generated historic events. Uh, do, do they assign uh, like a probability to the storms, like a return period? I don't know. That would have to be something that you would probably have to do with your own regressions after the fact, to the best of my understanding. Uh, there's like if you grab the historical storm and, and you look at it, and uh, you would get, you know, uh, an amount of precipitation over a time, but you would probably have to go back and, and the regression yourself to understand what the return interval is in that storm, to the, to the best of my knowledge. It's another source of rain data. And I think where it probably would fit in is if you knew a particular storm that perhaps generated a, a, a known flood at a particular return period, then you could use that. In, in this model, okay. it is uh, a way to enter in rainfall data. Well, it comes in handy if you uh, have a dam that the spillway fails during a storm, you can go back and figure out, well, what caused it to fail. Really? Yeah. So hopefully when you build it again, <laughs> it'll be bigger. <laughs> One thing to add to what Anthony was saying is, you know, he said PRISM is, Gauge corrected radar um, adjusted data to come up with precipitation values, um, but it weighs heavily on the radar side. And the radar is only so good as the radar is. Um, so, one thing I've come across with this is if there's a storm with lots of hail um, or your radar station is a long ways away from um, where you're looking at, it can either misrepresent by overcorrecting or misrepresent by missing part of your elevation band when your actual precipitation was in your site. So um, if you're going to use PRISM, make sure you look at where the mixture at the station is and get the same data. Good point. I have a, just a comment. One thing we've used it for when we were looking at the Beaver Creek model is we could look at what types of storms that drainage basin had, like just, you know, none of them were giant, but you could look at a whole bunch of them. And like, we noticed that a lot of them were really long storms, like lots of wetting rain up front before the big, you know, you know, three inch dump. So, I mean, it's just like a rough guide, but we could say, well, you know, for an estimating initial abstraction, if you're doing a big storm, you could say, well, here's several prism 
recorded storms that show it, it rained for three days steadily before the big dump came. So I mean, just it's kind of rough, but just another 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 source of information. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last thought on that is just trying to give a, a visual of it. Um, when you're at the golf course, usually they have like the, the AccuWeather radar pulled up on their screen in there to say, oh, there's a storm coming or whatever. And it projects it, you know, the next 15 or five minute intervals. And you can actually see the storm as it as it moves across and, and it kind of shifts and morphs and, and it has kind of a central point where it's most intense. That's pretty much what, what the historic data of prison looks like, except for it's just your one window in time. So uh, that would be kind of what it would be inputting into the model is similar to what that AccuWeather forecast is as, as it moves through time. Thank you. Fortunate enough to gauge data that could be of great value with uh, uh, developing the unit hydrograph for the basin. Yeah, absolutely. Validating it. But stream gauge data, you're saying. Yes, yeah, definitely. Eventually, and I, I took a course from ASCE just recently regarding radar um, precipitation data. And Montana's behind the curve, just like the rest of the Northwest part. And until um, the NOAA Atlas 14 comes out, it's, it seems that we're not going to be able to get this radar precipitation data. Um, and the basis behind the radar precipitation data, and, and you will be able to use it to forecast in HEC HMS, you can forecast a different storm event based on this data that's going to be available. Um, again, you have to use HEC DSS to download that data into it to be able to access it within HEC HMS. But you will be able to use that eventually. And it won't be, it's, it's similar to PRISM, but it's going to be a bit more robust than that. The idea behind using radar rather than gauge data is that gauge data is only good for a point where they can correlate the radar data for entire areas and have different rainfall events. And it becomes much more uh, robust that way to use in predicting storms. Um, I guess the big question I have is what is the sensitivity on these things? Um, uh, you know, and we're kind of using statistics to come up with um, the different storm events versus what might seem reasonable or what you know what we what we've kind of discovered from other um, sources. Um, but that is on the horizon, um, and it will require that if we're going to use that, we're going to have to learn how to use and have installed on the computer heck. DSS, um, because that is what hand, that's the handler of all these databases that can be used in HEC HMS. Um, what's, where's our, where are we? <laughs> We look at we're in data sources and suggestions for high frequency storms for another 50 okay. minutes. <laughs> we'll go through this and then we can go to it. Um, we're, we're ahead of schedule. <clears throat> so the question comes how do you know if your model's uh, reasonable? Um, and how do you uh, how do you, how do you do that? How do you verify? It? So um, we're going to talk about two different things. And this it sounds silly. <laughs> These are the terms that they use in uh, Tech Note One that talks about um, a calibration process, and they use the term calibration for the process of comparing it to actual gauge data. If you're fortunate enough to have a gauge on or near your basin or on the same basin, but in a different location, there are processes or methods to use that gauge data to verify the, that 
accuracy of your model. Okay. Pseudo calibration refers to a calibration process, but it's comparing it to data that has been generated like what you would get from stream stats. <clears throat> so um, they both mean the same thing, except you're just comparing it to different information. Um, <clears throat> and with the pseudo, so again, if, if you are fortunate enough to have gauge data on your, on your drainage, somewhere, um, then you can use that to help verify your model. But if not, then you're left with doing it against some other published type data. And the one that's typically used now is stream steps and coming up with an idea of what the, the return period is. <clears throat> um, and tech, or, yeah, technical note one has some pretty good resources and steps to follow. This is the, the uh, web link to that publication. Um, but it's, it's good to, everybody should be checking their model to make sure that it makes sense. So this is what we're kind of talking about. Um, what we're adjusting in the model. So this is my preference. If, if you're going to adjust something, adjust something that addresses the basic characteristics of what, whatever you're, you're dealing with. So that would include curve number. You can, you can adjust that. Um, you can try to adjust the unit hydrograph. <clears throat> um, really, that just kind of shifts the shape of that hydrograph, but it can affect the, the results coming out. You can possibly adjust the impervious area that we were considering there before um, in, in looking at how that might affect it. And then um, what's the other thing that you mentioned? Anesthesia. Oh, anesthesia. Well, it's curved. It's curved. Yeah. It's justification. Yeah. For <clears throat> what I don't necessarily like is, well, with the initial abstractions, uh, I, I, since it's developed as being tied in with the curve number. I don't like to independently change that. So I try to leave that alone. And, um, or, or using like adjusting the base flow to change the, the peak of what you're, you're getting at because it seems like such a random way to do it. And if you adjust it for one return period, is it going to hold for the next return period? So kind of stayed away from that. <clears throat> So I'm going to throw it out to you guys. What do you, what do you think? What what about? I want to comment on one broad thing, and that is, if you uh, if you're talking reservoirs, this is very important. If you use the unit hydrograph to adjust things, you're preserving volume. Whereas if you use the curve number to adjust things, you're you're adding or removing uh, water from the model. So if you lower the curve number uh, through initial abstraction and through the curve number itself. That water is permanently removed from the model, and and that that gets back to that effective precipitation comment. So so it's important to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah. So to uh, just a, a thought on the antecedent moisture because that wasn't really something we discussed a whole lot in no. the development of this. Yeah. Um, but my understanding of the way that that works after thinking about it for the last 15 minutes or so, um, isn't that going to alter your initial abstraction? Isn't that the way that calculation works? It changes your IA equals 0.2 to IA equals something different in that calculation. So changing your uh, Antecedent moisture condition would change your initial abstraction. I right. think so, yeah, because it, it is a way to adjust the curve number, right? But I'm not messing with the initial abstraction, I'm messing with the curve number. But the, okay, so I think uh, what you need to do, we, we should have the SES publication here, but what the antecedent moisture content does, if there's if you pick something where it's either high or low, it is a factor that adjusts the curve number. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so once you change the curve number, then yeah, it'll change the, inner, the initial abstraction. 
And the initial abstraction is based solely on the code number. Yeah. I think they're just they saying, tie them together. I think they're just saying don't go in and type in a number for that. Start at the beginning and then let the program recalculate based on what you changed initially. Oh yeah. Um, no, I, I get that. I just said maybe the the antecedent moisture comment. I'm still a little bit. Uh, that's probably where I think I'm, it would be worthwhile looking at the TR55 or whatever it sure. is that, That's that the doc, the guy talks that. about the antecedent moisture kind of thing. You're right. We didn't we didn't put that balance on the side of Mike, but Mike pointed out that you can use that a little bit in, in calibrating. Okay, things. yeah, I just I guess I'm kind of missing how that uh, alters the curve. So if you do have gauge data, that's the best, right? You, that, that, you're not going to get any better than that. So if you are fortunate enough to have that, or if you can look ahead and, and maybe try to put a gauge in, um, or if there's a way to take out some uh, reservoir operation data, all of that is if it's actual data, that's going to give you the best information that you can get. So you can try to try to use that. <clears throat> um, if it's a gauge that's located somewhere else on the basin, you would have to look at the USGS procedures to look at whether that you can use a ratio of the drainage areas to to make sure that it fits within their their methods, their procedures. Um, and there are limitations associated with that. And then the other thing that we didn't include in this too is what Mike point brought out is looking to see if there's upstream control. Is there a dam upstream that is controlling outflow? And how does that affect the flow in the particular area that you're in? <clears throat> Pseudo calibration, again, I'm just going back to stream stats. And this can open up a huge can of worms. Um, <clears throat> what it does is you can click on the little thing, it gives you the drainage area, and then you can ask for peak flow uh, statistics from this. So for that particular drainage area, it will give you peak information, peak discharge information for all these percent chance. So you gotta, you gotta take the inverse case, a 1% um, AEP, oh gosh, annual, Exceeds probability. It is a hundred year storm. Okay. <clears throat> so you take one divided by 0.01. Okay. 10% uh, would be a, a 10 year storm. All right. So, uh, and what it gives you, and everybody focuses in on this value right here. So this is the average of the regression values that you get from here. But then you also look over two columns over here, and they have PIL and PIU, which is a prediction interval lower and a prediction interval interval upper. <clears throat> and let's just take uh, the 20%, that's a five-year flood. The average is 23.9, but the range within that area could go from 10.2 to 56.2. Um, so if you're estimating something within that range, technically you're pretty good. And are those 90th percentile bounds meaning that 5% above and 5% below is that? That is a really good question that I'm not sure I can Kathy answer. Kathy, you, you, can, can you lead us in that? How do they calculate the prediction intervals on these? I think that is the 95%. I, I need to look, look back at stream stats to be sure, but I think that's the 95%. So, okay. percent of the time you'll be within that um, range. I think that's it might be 90, but I think it's 95. Okay, I just think it was 90, but if it's 95th, that means that 2.5% chance of being higher than the upper bound and 2.5% chance of being lower than the lower bound. Is that correct? That, that's a question for you, Kathy. Yes, I think so. Again, I was going to go to stream stats to see if it's 90 or 95. I was thinking it was 90, 90, but I'm not sure. Okay. You're probably right. You probably looked at it more recently than I. 
So when we talk about pseudo calibration, we're, we, we will get a peak flow coming out of this basin. <clears throat> and what I tend to do in a very simplistic way is to look at the average from stream stats to see if they match up. And I, you know, it's within that prediction interval and I tend to say, well, that's pretty good if it gets close to that. But what, do, what, what else do we want to consider? Yeah. One, one additional right. option that I will mention, um, we used for a, a different dam that we were looking at as part of this project is, um, Kathy again can can do much more justice to this than I can, but basin so stream stats, uh, as I think most people are familiar with, it uses basin characteristics. There is a recent publication on channel width based regressions, and Kathy did an excellent presentation, I think, to water operations folks. So I don't want to um, go too much into that. But I, I found that that was really helpful in an ungaged basin. Um, it was a, you know, there are independent variables and it sort of intuitively makes sense, right? That your active and bankful channel widths um, would reflect flood flows. And the, the third option there is remotely sensed, but that's another. Uh, Option I would I would just mention for folks is, is channel width based regression equations, in addition to the, the stream stats based and characteristics that were mostly. Is familiar. that is that available that information? Yes, so that it's available. I think those are available now in stream stats, so you can um, pull um, regression equation results based on channel width characteristics, like Brent was describing, and you can also. So pull um, information so that you can, you can also wait, you can combine methods. So you can use the, the regression results based on basin characteristics and weight those with the channel width characteristics. So there's all sorts of options. Um, basically now you used to have one number and now you have about five you can, you can look at. So it can be more confusing, but it, it is like Brent was saying, it's more information um, giving you a range of potential for you know 50 percent AEP values. Is that a Chuck Parrott's all about basin thing? Is that what was incorporated, Kathy? So so Chuck Parrott did the original um, it was included in stream stats, you know, the previous stream stats. And when they updated stream stats, they did not update those channel width equations. So um, me and my co-authors just updated the channel with equations last year. And, 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 so, you, and you carried so, forward the uh, Chuck Parrott's old way of combining the basic characteristics and the channel with data to come up with the composite value. Is that what I heard? That's right. That's right. Yep. That, that's super because that, that then allows you to reduce this uncertainty bounds, which is the Achilles heel of all the basic characteristic equations. And, and you know, it can in, in some regions. In some regions, it really doesn't help. So. Um, it depends on where you are, and yeah, you need to look at the resulting error bounds for for all the methods that you're looking at. But it can reduce uncertainty. That's the whole the whole reason. So right now, you can pull up the channel with regression results and stream stats. You can pull up the basin characteristics results, but the user has to weight them themselves. Um, in the future, we hope to get those weighted results available in stream stats. Are you giving guidance on how you would weight them or when you yes, would weight them? Yes, there are equations in the report. It's, it's not a fun equation, <laughs> but you can't you can do it yourself. I think Brent and others, some folks at MDT have developed spreadsheets that help you do that. Again, so right now a user has to, to do the weighting. The equations are published. Um, it, eventually we're gonna get those available in stream stats. That's what I'm I'm happy to send what I what I did for this other dam if anyone is interested. Um, as Kathy kind of alluded, it's matrix algebra, which if you're like me, you have maybe not done since your junior year of high school. Um, so the stream stats will compute the individual uh, regression flows for you, but weighting is the one thing that you need to do yourself, and it's 
somewhat involved, um, but in, in, depending on which hydrologic region you're in, as we've said, it can minimize your air bounds. So it, it may be worth doing depending on the project. Okay. And it's basin specific, which is super. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a, a good excuse to go out in the field, measure, measure the channel width. So this is what was done. Brent did this for the basin model here. Um, the red lines identify the upper and lower prediction intervals for the return interval is, is down on the x-axis and the flow is on the y-axis. <clears throat> um, the green dots are the peak flows that uh, were the result of the HEC HMS model <clears throat> um, that go along here. The, oh, I'm sorry, the blue line is the average value of the, of the regression equations. So you can see that, not too bad, um, that just using that um, weighted curve number that he had come up with and plugged it into the model, this is what he got. <clears throat> Um, the red dots are my little own exercise where I changed the model for the 10 year uh, return period. And I made it exactly equal to the average flow value that came out of stream stats. And I think I changed, I, I increased the curve number, not very much from 62.9 to 64 point something. Four. Yes, 64.4. <clears throat> but when I plug it in for the other return periods, you can see that it starts to deviate away further from the average than the other one. So, and, and that's as far as I took it. I didn't try to narrow it down or do any more sensitivity analysis. And I didn't adjust anything else. But that's what you would do in a, in a, in a model. You would try to adjust it so that you felt that appropriately, the results that you're getting are near the average curve and still staying within the, the prediction intervals that they have there. I'll, I'll comment that maybe it's better to have the vertical axis and the log, logarithmically, you know, just put the logarithmic <coughs> expression of that because the error bounds are uh, computed logarithmically and they'll be more symmetric around the uh, median oh, okay. value there, and that'll help better to interpret where you where it is. Gotcha. And, and then the other thing I'll comment on is more more twisty with, with, with regards to, you know, using that to pseudo calibrate um, the, the, the values are, Computed independently, so so they computed using you know when they did the stream stats, they said what is the flow that correspond what we we're going to have a hundred year event and and then they do the statistics and come up with the the best estimate there on the blue line and the uncertainty bounds. They're not intended to come in from the y axis and say okay um, let's say a seventy five cfs flow what is the occurrence interval of that you cannot go over and say it's one hundred years. That, that would be incorrect to do that. And, and the recurrence interval of the 75 CFS flow is probably more frequent than 100 years. And, and there's some work that I think Dr. Beth Faber has, has done. And uh, she's with the Corps of Engineers, I believe, where, where she does Monte Carlo simulations on this sort of thing to you know, do that. But the, the Kind of main takeaway is is that when you're pseudo calibrating to come up with the best estimate, you probably need to be above that blue line by a substantial um, proportion, perhaps a standard deviation or so. If you're talking spillways, where you're essentially asking that question, okay, my spillway capacity is 75 cfs. What is the uh, corresponding Best estimate of the recurrence. I got you. Yeah, those make sense. 
essentially like the, the the way this is developed, the Gaussian curve is vertically oriented, you know, with the tails going up in terms of CFS and down. But if you're asking the other question, you have to have something that we don't have, and that's you know the Gaussian curve that's horizontally oriented to estimate exceedance. It's good to be above and, and not by if, if you're on, you're probably actually above. Well, I mean, would that, are you suggesting we apply that to this, to what we're trying to do? Yeah. I think it depends if all the storms coming into a reservoir. I think it depends on what you're trying to do, what the adverse consequence is. Because right. if, right. if uh, the adverse consequence were, um, it's, it's kind of the wider the uncertainty band, the more the more conservatism you have to have in it. And worse than that, if you're ask, asking that question of, of what is the return interval, the actual, there's a bias. The blue line is biased to the unconservative side. But for Southwestern Montana, you know, if, these, if there was no uncertainty, there would be no bias. But there's a, th those bands are so wide that there's substantial, Bias. I did that for a but in southwestern Montana region for you know some particular basin for the five hundred year return interval plot, and that flow it corresponded you know to the blue line that five hundred years wound up having a return interval of like eighty years. You know, so it was much much more frequent, and the bias effect was really trivial. So in your mind, you would you would try to get up in this. Not maybe not that high, but uh, I would say one at least above the average. Maybe one standard deviation would be appropriate if that was in the log domain and those are the 95 percentile. I think that'd be about halfway in between. Okay. Those are 90th percentile, they might be a little higher than halfway between. Yeah, that, that's just rule of thumb. You know, at one standard deviation, you might be conservative sometimes. Than conservative. Yeah. Any other comments? All right. Let's take a break. Are, are we ready to get rolling with some example <laughs> problems? Yeah, I think so. Are you good where you are, Brent, there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm great. Just just me. So um, let me share my screen, and I think it'll be easiest. I'm just on a little laptop, so bear with me. I think it'll be easiest if I just share the whole screen. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. And, can, and you can hear me. Okay. I, I switched to a headset, so I don't have to yell at the laptop <laughs> yeah we can okay great i'm gonna do just a brief intro for basin number two <clears throat> and then anthony and i will do a few uh example heck hms problems along with you guys so if you are um, in the conference room or in your own office uh have, and have your laptop ready um, you can play along at home so um, basin number two, like I said, uh, I think anybody from Montana will recognize that aerial image, even from space. We're just south of Butte there uh, in the, the Basin Creek area. Uh, so Basin Creek number one is a larger downstream reservoir, and Basin Creek number two is a smaller upstream reservoir. You guys can see my mouse when I point, right? Yes. Cool. Uh, interrupt me uh, as I go with, with any questions or thoughts. Um, I know we've we've got a bunch of dam nerds here, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about a dam. So the introduction problem statement, uh, you can see basin number one on the left lower photo and basin number two on the right. They are part of Butte Silverbow's municipal water supply, their drinking water system. 
the upstream basin number two reservoir functions as a settling pond. Number one is high hazard and uh, number two was reclassified as not high hazard in 2019 um, based on operation of, of basin number one uh, essentially being able to, to contain the full contents of the upstream reservoir. And I've got a couple photos that'll um, maybe show that a little better than, than talking about it. This is a quick screenshot. Actually, Sam Johnson did the hazard classification. And that's, that's all I want to convey here is basin number two upstream. And it, if it were to fail based on the setting of the Obermeyer gate for basin number one, it would basin number two's contents would be fully contained in basin number one. I'm going to say the word basin an awful lot. Um, and an Obermeyer gate, I know a lot of you probably know, but it's just a bottom hinged uh, pneumatically actuated gate. And that is on the spillway of basin number one. So it's what controls their normal operating pool. And that's what it, it looks like in all its glory. This shows a few of those key elevations. This is basin number one. Um, it just shows the gate setting, parapet elevation, and, and all I, I, you know, just, just want to convey um, that basic setup. So we're focused on basin number two for this workshop. It's a small drainage area, like we've said already. Um, and so it's a, it's a good one for a, a workshop model as it's not, not too complex. It was 1897 construction, so it's quite old, 49 foot high timber crib, rock earth fill, and it has an unreinforced and deteriorated concrete core. Currently, it's uh, 79 acre feet at normal pool, and Gary has said that it has actually two spillways. It's been breached and lowered twice, and that breach spillway, we have a, have a couple photos of that, is just an unlined earthen channel. The emergency spillway uh, is the sort of in disuse concrete lined channel, and the outlet is 12 inch diameter cast iron and it is inoperable. Um, like we've we've gone through all these parameters for our HEC HMS model. So this is all uh, information that you would, would need to plug in. And we talked about the, the basin and trees and beetle kill fairly extensively. Quick photos of that breach and the earthen spillway. This is the lower spillway. Obviously, it's what controls normal operating pool. Uh, and you can, you can see it flowing here in these photos. Emergency spillway, concrete. Um, I, I thought about this after I had to manually uh, tabulate the rating curve and pull it from a, a graph into tabular form. And I thought about how silly that was to have these, try to have these exact numbers when this is the reality on the ground, but that's probably the case with a lot of the work we do. So just to set up why, why we're looking at this, why is it important to understand the hydrology of this basin and what risk-informed decisions might Butte Silverbow have in the future? And like we've talked about, a lot of these will could apply if, if you are a regulator, if you're a dam owner, if you are a consulting engineer. Another nice summertime photo of the reservoir um, and that, that breach spillway. Basin number two has pretty significant seepage around the conduit and some pretty significant deterioration as well of that outlet conduit. This seepage increases with reservoir elevation. It's quite a bit of foundation seepage as well. You can, you can see all of this water loving vegetation in this photo. They do have some measuring devices, but they need improvement. Um, and, and maybe it would be helpful if they could be read remotely. 
mentioned the concrete core uh, that may provide some comfort, but it's it's unreinforced and has deteriorated. So it's probably fairly ineffective in terms of adding any stability or, or seepage control. Quick photo of that dam and what what does it look like if this were to rise three feet? Um, you know, how, how would that impact seepage? Could we get a piping failure um, or erosion, you know, erosion around that conduit? What, what sort of storm recurrence interval would cause that rise uh, in the reservoir? Michelle is gonna recognize a number of these slides. I, I sort of co-opted uh, one of her presentations and specifically would like to draw your attention to the, the voodoo hydrology doll uh, and, and the magic hat. And this is, a I think, a, a fun graphic of the process that we're going through today, right? We've talked about all these different elements. So um, this is what, what happens when a, you ask a geotech to talk about hydrology. <laughs> and actually, I think the next next slide with some of the, the considerations is, yeah, is the one I want. So, you know, th these are just examples of, of the risk informed decision making that Silverbow, uh, dam safety, uh, or consulting engineers might want to answer. We've talked about this unusual setup with the Obermeyer gate and the hazard classification of basin number two being predicated on that setting. Uh, you know, what, what's an elevation that we should set that gate at to handle a storm event safely? And even what storm event do we want to um, design that for? I think it was Rob who mentioned too, you know, if you were uh, replacing a spillway, um, this this sort of modeling and, and decision making would would also be applicable there. Um, for the downstream dam, what type of flows could that spillway handle without downstream damage? There's a campground right below basin number one. Uh, you know, we could Butte Silverbow uh, could consider remote monitoring to give, an, give us a heads up if there's a problem with seepage or if the reservoir is rising quickly due to storm event. Uh, what interventions could be taken? You know, siphon, pump, that type of advance planning. And then long term, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the solution here is to breach basin number two and come up with an alternate plan to deal with the sediment for their municipal water supply. Um, maybe it's to replace it, maybe it's to rehabilitate it. But that's, that's just a quick and dirty overview of basin number two without trying to get too, too lost in the weeds. Um, I think any, any questions on that, any, any thoughts on that? Um, and, and actually, if not, I think Anthony is going to launch into our first example problem. Okay, hearing none, this is the basin that we're, we're looking at and I will stop sharing and then uh, Anthony is going to do um, an example example of, so if, if you have downloaded those files that were in the OneDrive that we sent out a couple days ago, um, you should have those on your machine now. And we are gonna walk through a pretty quick process of importing that DEM and, um, oh, look. And, sorry, the, the camera, um, importing that DEM and pulling it into a terrain model. So if you guys are interested in, in learning that, you can follow along. Uh, if not, Anthony, I think will share his screen and, and you can watch and perhaps review the guidance manual later if you need to do that. And Brent left uh, some thumb drives with the files if you don't have them downloaded. They're, they're right over here. Well, thanks, Brent. Uh, was everyone able to get the files downloaded off the of OneDrive, or do you need the, the thumb drive to finish on? Everyone's good. Okay. Uh, so I guess we'll.
you want to go ahead and open up just a blank HMS model. Just, uh... Anthony, could you share your screen? Yeah. Thank you. Does everyone have a, a blank HMS model to open? Okay, cool. Um, and then if you have your uh, folder that you downloaded, uh, one of the subfolders in there should be this with DEM. Find that. So we are going to go to this components tab at the top. File new project here. So you have to start something. We'll name it. Start. Yeah. So let's, we'll, yeah, we're going to start from, from the beginning on this one. Um, and we'll call it basin. We'll just title it my R there. Uh, call it unit. Go to custom areas. And you can go ahead and create that. I'm not going to add any additional description. And then we'll go into the components tab. And the first thing we'll have to do is create a basin model. We'll go to the basin model manager, select new, we'll call it basin two. A basin model now. We will go into the components again. We'll go into our terrain data manager. We'll do a new terrain. And we'll name our new terrain basin LIDAR. And click next. And this is where we'll navigate to that file path, wherever you save the one uh, with the, the DEM file. You can select the, the .tip file. Do you remember your model set? Yeah, it's agent HMS model. And then click DEM. Oh, sorry. And then it's uh, basically DEM and it's the .tip file. We'll select that. And the vertical units on that, that digital elevation model are meters. So we're good there. And we'll click finish. So we have, we have our, our train in. Did that work for everybody? Just hit close that. Just close that. Yeah, you can hit next and then close that. And you should have a, a you, you can close the train data manager. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, you can close out of that. Um, size. So that base, that uh, train data, is that something you just generated uh, um, separately from clipping it from that, that data set you were talking about? So the, the terrain data is actually part of the LIDAR collection that was done for the floodplain study. Oh. And you can, you as a DNRC employee can get access to those. It's on a, a separate drive. For non-DNRC employees, I think you have to re request them through the Montana State Library. Okay. Um, and, and what we did with those as far as processing goes is you download them and they're pretty small tiles. So this one I think was probably four or six tiles that we had to download. And then you have to mosaic them all together to make the four or six tiles into one tile. And then you take your watershed shape file and clip that out. Um, you buffer your watershed shape file first, and then you clip it out. Um, and that's what we have here is the, the actual final buffered clipped uh, LIDAR data that we all just imported. Okay, so for those of us who are not that GIS knowledgeable, we could get the, the drainage area from stream stats yep. and then have the GIS 
folks give you this this tip tip file is that correct yeah yeah okay. um absolutely i think if, if you just grab the, the drainage area shape file you know if you when you do the stream stats thing they, they give you an option to download the shape file i think it, on, on on one of those is, is the best way to do it if you just give them the shape file and say would you buffer this and provide me with uh, a digital <laughs> elevation model uh, okay. they would be able to do that okay. uh, in virtual area do you right. specify grid density for the tip file you do not it's inherent within the LIDAR data? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I think this, this, this cells in this, I'm not exactly sure. They're probably three to five feet cells. I'm not, um, off the top of my head, that's a guess. But what the uh, file size? We have, what is it? Uh, it's 900K, it's all. Okay. Um, so yeah. If so you're I, I was just going to add, Anthony, if you know if you're somewhere without lidar coverage, you could use a 10 meter DEM. Um, just download from the USGS national map, and whenever you sort of take a modeling training course like this, so this this watershed is is pre prepared for you. They always say, well, if you don't know how to do this, you know, just ask the GIS staff in in your firm. And so um, we will have the guidance document that explains this, but. But yeah, if, if you need help pre-processing all the GIS stuff, just talk with your GIS expert. Uh, so yeah, back on, on track with this. If you go into and expand the basin model in your table of contents, and then you highlight basin number two, you can go down here in this bottom dropdown. Uh, it says terrain data, and you would select you can make that window wider too. I wish I could just hide this whole thing. I don't know why it doesn't go up. I don't know if I out. I'll just keep chasing it around. Um, anyways, if you go to this this terrain data here uh, and choose base and lidar that we just created, and then you'll have to you click save at, in the top left corner. And this is going to ask you to define a coordinate system. Um, you can do this, and if you're having issues, I would recommend doing it. This one has worked for me. Uh, if you don't choose a coordinate system, it will use the projected coordinate system that are associated with the terrain that we just imported. So if we skip this, it should it should work, and it'll just give us that WTS 84 projection. Uh, and if you're having issues, I would recommend selecting one, but this one will work if you just skip. Um, and Double check that you can go to this GIS and coordinate system, and it'll give you your, your, your projection information. But that seemed to work. Did that, uh, that work for everybody? Mm -hmm. Did that come in? Cool. Um, and then within that, now that we have our, our train associated with our basic model in HMS, you just go to these GIS tabs, and we're going to do some kind of some terrain. Pre-processing, which is just some kind of cool stuff. Um, Pre-process sinks will identify anywhere that, that water kind of stores. Uh, and again, GIS pre-process drainage. This gives you uh, like hill shade and, and some similar stuff there. Uh, and then I like to go into the view after I've done these, and you can go view map layers. And I like to turn off uh, this flow direction and flow accumulation. And, and that kind of gives us the terrain and you can still see these sinks. So once you once you turn those off, you can keep them closer. And then you can just mouse wheel zoom in. You can see where your basin creek reservoir is on the terrain. Yes, and we'll identify streams. Oh, we could have done this before we zoomed in. Uh, I'll, I'll just say go ahead and do this at 0 0.7, because uh, that's the number we've been using for these. How'd you get to identify streams? Uh, oh, sorry, it's in the, it's back in the GIS tab at the top. Yes, sir. And, uh, you can you can play around with this is kind of one of the more iterative steps that you'll end up doing this kind of back and forth. 
the 0 0.7 number will give us one sub basin, which is kind of what we're going for here. If you identify the streams uh, at a smaller area, you'll end up with more sub basins. So if we did uh, like 0 0.5, like it was that originally, you end up with something like 60 sub basins for your uh, five square mile area. And that's just kind of ridiculous. Um, so we'll stick with the 0 0.7. If I'm missing something fundamental, I call my bottom part with identify streams and such as grayed out. Uh, did you did you pre-process both of them, Rob? Did you do the pre-process sinks and pre-process drainages? I did, yes, in the reverse order of both. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no worries. Uh, that's kind of the intent of this is to hopefully uh, get everyone to get this together. Yeah. No worries. So uh, everybody got a stream that looks like this kind of running through their, their basin model. Um, and then this is kind of the, the point where you want to zoom into the reservoir um, and, and the delineation part. Then you can go up to this top to this breakpoint tool uh, and you want to select that as the red dot at the top. Okay. And once you click it, it's activated. It'll give you kind of the, the crosshair style cursor. And you can you can click make sure to click on your streamline at the down outlet, which uh, is right about here. If that's my guess, and we'll call this basin two down. Oh, I'm going in. What, what window did you bring up to get rid of some of the data up there? You got a window and you were getting rid of. Come on, Gary. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, so, Gary, you just you just go to the map and, and you kind of mouse wheel in. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got two different, uh, different where you, you eliminated some layers. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. So, that's in the view tab. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, go to map layers. Yep. You know, view and then sorry. the map layers. No worries. <laughs> Uh, and then these are the ones that I have on right now. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. okay. So thank just, you. And then we're back to uh, to the uh, breakpoint creation tool. This this guy up here. We got it turned on, and we're gonna create our dam down here. We'll call it. Uh, basin number two, uh, yeah. and we'll we'll create that point. So we, we all have the dam, and then we'll go to uh, the elements. This will be the GIS tab. Once you click that, you can identify a prefix here. We're going to rename them. I would rename them. Uh, we can call, I guess we can name them here since we're only going to have one. Uh, we can call it basin two. And the reach. We won't even have a response when we wish to break the amount. Is that in sure. case you have multiple uh, like tributaries? Is that the so the reaches connect the, the sub basins. Um, so if, if we were to do this 
if we were going to do this delineation, we would have more than one sub basin. But then you would you would have reaches that connect the sub basin. Oh, okay. Oh, um, gotcha. Okay. But being as this delineation, we know we're only going to have the one sub basin the way it's set up because that's uh, that's going to be determined by that point seven we use for our, our stream identification. And that's why we chose the point seven is so we could have just the one sub basin. Um, but if you were to have a, a larger watershed area or, or a study area where you wanted to have mul multiple sub basins within your, your area, then you would end up with reaches. Um, and, and this is just going to give them, assign them a, a kind of a, a default name. Um, and you can go in and change the names to, to something more uh, applicable after the fact, it's a little bit more descriptive of, of what they actually are. But yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll click delineate. And that will give you the kind of the delineated model like we've been looking at. Uh, a little bit different than uh, the one that we looked at in PowerPoint. I think it's got a, a slightly smaller buffer area, not really significant. Um, and it looks like, for the most part, it all came through all right. Uh, click on basic two, and then this is where you can go in and rename these if you would like to. Uh, sync is, is actually the game. Really building your model from here. Uh, these are so our, our delineation area on the lidar was four point eight three, which might be slightly different than uh, what was done with the the ten meter DPI, but they're pretty close. Minus four point four. Yeah, it's a minus two. Yeah. Really? Yep. Yeah. Our name is supposed to be like. Oh, I click it down by view. No. I mean, it was right at the top tip of that reservoir. Here. Did you click? Right. About right. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. How many got 4.4? 4. 4? I did. Uh, how many got 4.4? Only hydrometric. We're just. <laughs> <laughs> only hydrometric people. Yeah. 4.4. 4. 4, that's, that's kind of a big difference. Or one five. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ask that, Rob? So, are you saying that if we had typed in zero point five, then we'd have like a bunch of these showing? Yeah. So, if we go back and we go and identify streams again, and you and go zero point zero five, we click OK. And so then we go GIS and the delineate elements. And I'll go S, uh, R, uh, and delineate. Click and right. Yeah, it's just going to say that we're going to overwrite what we already have done. Gotcha. And then you'll get. Oh. So now you can go <laughs> gotcha. something like that, which is kind of, and then you can go in and merge these. Yeah, that's pretty neat. This looks like the yeah. 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 Anyways, you can go in and merge these as you fill out the stuff. Yeah, that's a bit different. Yeah, the identified screen is kind of iterative. We had a few hours. Yeah, and then the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or at least it worked with the but it's been oh, yeah. it's why didn't it two years ago. Really oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And you would probably, you know, go in and call this, yeah. I don't know, upper basin. Yeah. Right? You had to get on the This might be like upper west basin creek lake. Um, and then you would you name them as you see fit for. So, and then if you put in a higher number than 0 0.7, yeah. then just nothing shows up? So, I just am wondering how you arrived at like. <laughs> you just played with it till he got what he wanted. Till he, till he yeah, had one stream. Pretty much. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. If you put in, uh, <laughs> 
I don't know, what if you just put in one? Maybe you might not get anything. You probably get. So, this one. What are those? Yeah, what are they based on? Soil beds? You were just messing around? No, these are, these are based on streets. So, I guess probably your, your threshold is going to be your basin area there. If you do more than the 4.4 4 that you delineated at, you won't get any line here. Like this, this, this uh, streamline won't exist if it's larger than your area. So I think as long as you do <coughs> something close to that, you probably end up with one sub base. Right? Sounds good. That's probably a good point. Yeah. What's your training? It seems like you would want to think about how you're going to verify the model. So it, say if you're going to use a regression equation, you probably want to make sure your drainage area or your sub basin size is within the what the data that was used for the regression. So if you, you're saying if you're using like uh, different regression equations for different regression equations for your different sub basins, um, then you would want them to match the area wise. Is that, or well, this isn't something I understand very well. Maybe Kathy can help. But the regression equations were based on a number of different sub basin sizes, and you want to make sure that you're if you're going to use those that you're drainage area is within the num the base the data that went into the okay. model. Yeah. Did yeah. I upper and lower bound. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's that's probably a, a, a really good question. I don't know if uh it'd be pretty low. Kathy, are you out there? Yeah, that's that's a good point. You I mean I think what we might be with is basins that are very, very small. So you just want to compare those ranges that are published in the report. And you also want to be sure that if you're calibrating, when you go into stream stats and delineate your basin, that it's the same. And I think you guys already discussed that. Yeah, we, I don't think that was something we, we did give a, a, enough consideration to was oh, yeah. basin size um, and, and using the regression equations. Because I don't, I guess I don't remember looking in any USGS publication to see if there was a, a minimum size for your basin. <coughs> I think it's like two square miles. It's like we're, okay. we're within the we're within the limits for basin. Um, stream stats will give you an automated error if you're not, okay. or a, ca a caution maybe is the word. But but we were this this model is within those limits. Uh, well, that's kind of all I was going to share for, for this one. Uh, any questions that we're putting? Kind but of it does point out, I mean, because I'm looking at the shape of my drainage. So I got the 4.4 square miles. Okay. And my outline cut off the upper right portion up there quite a bit oh, yeah. compared to what oh, yours yeah. is. This stuff? Uh, no, no, upper, uh, upper right. No, right, where it says basic two down. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it cut it off significantly. So well, that's, oh, yeah. so you'd probably want to go get a Topo map and actually look at that. Yeah, you so need to make sure you're clicking on whatever because I I think it was just a fraction of a pixel that we probably clicked on sure. something a little bit lower and it changed it significantly. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was, four point eight right with that one four five ten dog legs left. I clicked right at the top of that. Um, and then here you clicked just a little bit below that. Right. Really? Oh so, changed it that much, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So you might want to, you know, try to verify it with something else like stream stats or or triple sure. map of some sort. Yeah. Well, and I guess maybe uh, if you go just a little bit downstream, maybe you're better off bearing yeah. on the downstream side. Well, it, yeah, you would get you would get closer to what you got for sure. Did you uh, say you could bring in a shape file too, separate? Yeah, if you wanted like an imported georeference element. Yep. Yeah, if you had like a, a stream file or, or a sub basin shape. So if we went into stream stats and exported a shape file to basin, um, then we could then bring in that shape file yeah. here to that stream. Yeah. Um, then you wouldn't need to run the delineation at all in this. Uh, 
But would it, if you did that, would it create the sinks uh, at the, the basics for you? Or would you have to do that? You know, the old one? I think, the, the, to my knowledge, I think you still have to do it this way. Maybe there's a, there's probably a way that you uh, import a shape file. Um, but all of these fields here that are within it are populated based off of the delineation that it performs and using the, the, the geo reference projected uh, terrain. So, you can you can manually edit those though, right? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, I mean, you can just change them if you want to. So you could set up something and then manually change it what you want. Yeah, I think just the the kind of the the, the part about the terrain that I like is the fact that it populates those for you. But if, if you had something that required you to, to match uh, uh, something else for some reason, a uh, base and area exactly, or, or something like that, then you can go in and, and edit these all yourself to, to fit what your needs are. But you could bring in a shape file just to double check and then turn it off, right? You could import the shape or the shape file drainage area from yeah, stream stats. Compare your stream stats to just, your, your delineation here. Yeah, and go, oh, good, it's good. Or, ooh, no, maybe I did something wrong. So it might be a good double check. With this one, this is Brent's example. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right, Michelle, that where you could uh, bring in the, the, the stream stats delineation and compare uh, where they differ. Um, or also, kind of the, the area is always probably a good check as well. Uh, If your area is, is off a lot from because your stream sets will be good in the area as well. And it's like that's as long as they're fairly close, you're probably all right. Because spatially it's not really, you know, it's it looks nice spatially, but there's really not uh, anything influencing the model here besides the area here. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Brent, do you want to take over? Sure. You're in. Okay. Um, can, yeah, if you can stop sharing, I will share my screen. Um, I'm just going to share this entire screen. Okay. So um, if you guys will close out of that, um, and then we're just going to open HMS up again, just blank blank project. And I, I really can't hardly see folks in the room. So if, if um, I need to stop or, you know, something happens, please just, just yell out. Uh, so uh, same thing with HMS is, is like RAS uh, best practice is to have the program open. And then you're going to navigate to the file that you want, the, the project that you want to open. And so this should be in that HEC HMS models folder. We're going to open the zero model setup. And you go through all those folders and this last one that has the HMS extension, select that. And that should open up. Let me make this as big as I can here. Okay, so um, we've, you know, sort of in the interest of time, this is a partially built model, has a lot of, especially like the paired data already in there for you guys. We don't want to have people copying and pasting a thousand lines from Excel in a workshop. Um, you know, so maybe this model, we're, we're going to go through some of the user interface and how you would actually get a model to run. Um, you know, maybe you've spent 10 years since you've opened Tech HMS, or maybe you have a junior engineer who uh, 
left this model and, and they decided they, they're going to quit and go backpack South America. So um, I like to, especially when you're looking at a partially built model or I actually, when you're starting a new model, I find it helpful to look at previous examples you've done. So I like to look, open, open these up and see what, what is already in there. Uh, and this model should, if you click there on your basin model, it should pull in all that terrain uh, and everything that we just did with Anthony. So that should come up as soon as you click on your basin number two model. So we're just going to go through some of these different data sources and then finish this model up so that we can run it and get some initial results. Talked about all of these different components already. Gary gave us a good overview, but we've got our subbasin and then actually the reservoir itself, that reservoir element. Um, so uh, looking, looking through the model, we, for the, excuse me, looking at the subbasin, we um, discussed and look at here, I've got even a different, um, different drainage area, 4.9. I bet that's actually from the stream stats delineation, I think is what that, where that came from. So um, I'm not gonna worry about these top three elements, but the curve number obviously is critical to this method. We can see our junior engineer forgot to put in a curve number. So if you've been paying really close attention to the slides, you probably know what the, the right one or what we calibrated to already. But um, let's pick something you know we think is, is reasonable for an evergreen dominated basin, maybe 66 because I like the number six. We are going to, as we've said already, we're going to let HEC HMS compute the initial abstraction. And if you want to put in the percent imperviousness, you can do so here. But if you, if you do that, if you enter it here, don't also weight your curve number with that impervi percent imperviousness. So, so choose one or the other of those options. Either weight your curve number or enter percent imperviousness there. So far, so good. We've already entered those two parameters for our Clark unit hydrograph. Those came straight from the spreadsheets for technical note one that we've gone over. And we've talked as well about the constant monthly base flow and how, um, how important that can be in a frequent storm as compared to a, like a probable maximum flood. Okay. So we are satisfied more or less with that subbasin. Now we will look actually at the reservoir element itself right there on our, on our graphic. And the reservoir element is tied to all of this paired data that has been, has been pre-entered into this model. So, you know, we'll, we'll look here. Here's the, the basic rating curve for that breach spillway, basic rating curve for the emergency spillway, and then elevation storage function, whether that's in your O&M or something that you synthesize. Um, however, however you get that, those paired data like we've talked about are, are just XY data as contrasted with the time series data, which obviously vary with time. So um, we need to make sure that our reservoir element here is properly tied to all of those paired data. Otherwise our model won't run. And chosen initial elevation here is the breach spillway. And you can see here that our junior engineer who is in the wilds of South America currently didn't tie it to the right didn't tie it to a, a storage function. So make sure that you do that in your model. Um, again, if you're building your model from scratch, 
you'll just create a paired data component to tie that to. Next, we've got spillways and a dam top for this model. Dam top. Oh, was that a? No, okay, we're good. Um, dam top uh, right would be important if your dam were to overflow uh, or to overtop rather. We are, are very hopeful that that's not gonna be the case for a 10 year storm. But if you've got this data, uh, enter, it, enter it here. Same thing with spillways. So spillways need to be tied to the appropriate paired data. Spillway number one uh, is not tied to anything. You can, I think we mentioned this, you, if you wanna model it just as broad crested or OG, you can do that. But we have a rating curve and we are gonna use breach spillway is the lowest one first to activate. So we're gonna say that's spillway number one. Spillway number two, we're gonna make it the emergency spillway because that one is the second to activate. So should be satisfied there with uh, our reservoir element. You guys can, can play around in your free time and, and look at the other elements here, but I will. What's that mean when it says direction named? What's that mean? Yeah, let uh -huh. me. Auxiliary I think it has to do with the direction of flow. Yeah. Yep. So and so opposed as opposed to the drop down, it says auxiliary. Mm. I thought it, uh, it went in the direction of flow down the stream channel as opposed to diverting off. But I yeah, and we're gonna through. we're gonna send both both of our spillways in the main downstream direction. Um, in that, so if you, when we look at our results, like if you were to look, I believe at, um, you'll see the hydrograph both for the basin itself and then what's going to come out of the reservoir. Um, and I think that, I think that's where you would see that difference if you chose a, you know, main, if, if flow is going over one spillway down the main direction versus an auxiliary direction. So um, we have a, meteorological model already in here. Uh, Gary highlighted this, make sure that you include that, you, that this is tied to the proper gauge. And we have already entered all of that data for you. Um, but again, this, we, we developed this just using those methods from technical note one. Um, and here's a quick, quick graph that shows what that precipitation data looks like. And you need to make sure that that is tied. The gauge data is tied to your um, meteorological model. And we are using that specified hydrograph method. I think that's all that I needed to highlight here. Um, nothing looks out of place with our paired data with our XY data. Um, I've got to move this down so I can get see with the zoom controls. Um, but if we go, oops, if we go to compute and try to create a simulation run, it's not going to run. It doesn't even give us that option. It's grayed out. Does anybody know what is what is missing from this? What do we still need? Control specifications. That's it. Yep, we need to create a control specification. So you can come in here, components, create component, put in a control spec, and you can name it whatever whatever you'd like. And best practice for all modeling, right, is to give it a description. But we'll do that do that later. Um, something I want to highlight too. So I'm going to close this. It gives <laughs> away the answer. Um, control specifications. And let's see there, we can see that. Um, you're gonna tell, tell your model start date and time to run everything. And with this, we've chosen a constant, base, constant monthly base flow method and our hiatograph data are also uh, in, in a 
day, month, year format. So you guys already know this, but May and June are probably the months where we're gonna have the highest base flow. So we wanna be conservative and we will choose a May run date for this model. And that base flow is gonna be a constant 10.1 CFS over the whole month. And let's see if I can pull this up. So uh, if you were doing, you know, if you're building this from scratch, you would obviously be entering your precipitation data here. We have a 72 hour storm, but this just, we've, we've just gone through the 5th of May just to um, have that extra time. So we're gonna go now into the control spec and say, based on this um, May date, we wanna start our model on May 1st, 2000. I won't even tell you guys what I was doing in 2000, but it was not <laughs> rainfall runoff modeling. Uh, probably blissfully unaware of, of these capabilities. <laughs> so um, for an end date, you know, let's go 15 days. We're gonna run it until May 15th. That will give, we've got a 72 hour storm and that should give us plenty of time both for that storm to finish and then for all of that flood to route through the reservoir and we should be able to come back down to our base flow data. At midnight again, that's that's when all failures and, and problems happen is midnight. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, there you go. <laughs> And we're going to choose a time interval of one hour um, for for these control specs. You know, if you were, especially if you were doing something like dam breach modeling, you would need a really, would want a really fine time yeah. interval. Um, but I, I think this is probably sufficient for one hour interval is probably sufficient. That should be it. So now uh, save that. And if you, if we go up to compute, create compute should give us the option now to run this. And we will call this one the 25 year storm because those are the data that we have already input. Simulation run needs a basin model. We're gonna use basin number two. It shows up as our only option because we have only one. So click next. We're gonna use 25 year meteorological model. You know, I think the example that Anthony is going to do uh, will have multiple meteorological models. So, but we only have one for this example. Next, control spec, we just talked about that. Last thing we need, finish. <clears throat> that should be our simulation run that we just created. There's, um, multiple ways that you can actually hit compute. But if you come in um, over here, click on this compute tab and we will select our 25 year simulation run. Just click this sort of fun explosion button and it should run through, finish pretty quickly. Uh, and if, if we have done everything right, we will get some results to take a look at. And I'm not gonna go to- Where's the explosion button there? So if you, um, we, if you go to compute and then select your little 25 year simulation run, whatever you've called it. Some 
expand all three of those. I'll kind of give you a little show. I'll repeat those. And then the other one will uh, Simulation uh, end time, 31 December, yeah. 1969. Hmm. Maybe, yeah, maybe you can check your, your control specs if if it's giving you weird weird times. Those, um, you know, make sure that our control specs match our precipitation uh, and the base flow that we're interested in. I think it's a best practice to have all, the, all three of those line up. Otherwise, if you run a storm and you're, you're worried about an event in May and you run a storm in January, it's gonna pull the, the January base flow data. So um, I'm not gonna go too in depth into, into the results, but um, under your results, you'll, you'll see the runs, all, if, if you've done four, four different events, however many you've done, uh, you'll see the results there. And uh, global summary gives you the total runoff volume and the peak discharge say we're interested in the reservoir because because we're damn damn nerds uh, maybe we want to take a look at this graph and see how the elevation in basin number two what happens with this 25-year storm and say i don't i'm not a water user i'm an engineer so i don't really care about the storage i just want to look at the elevation so we'll go in here and remove that hit okay so our, here's our starting elevation, 6,008.5. And then you can see maybe around day oh, seven or eight, we start to start to come back to that, um, to our, our base flow conditions. So base flow raises that reservoir by 2.2 feet, something like that. And then our storm event here bumps it up to 6,012 or so. Um, For the 25 year storm. One question I've got for you, Brent, is it looks like um, before your time step starts and the flow starts flowing into the reservoir, the, the storage is still increasing as a result of the base flow. Um, uh, is this set up just the way that you guys have set this up? Is that set up to um, normalize, I guess, on the back end, or, or you know, if we were to let let that precipitation and runoff start, like let's say fifth of May instead of first of May, would we reach a storage volume of uh, what's that, 105 acre feet? To start before our storm, or, or how would that work? I, I wonder too if, if the same the same question um, if we could ask it a, a second way, not to not to confuse things, but when we choose, um, let's see, our initial conditions, we have chosen an elevation. You could also choose inflow equal to outflow, and I wonder if if that would um, you know, take into account that the even the base flow raises this two two feet above the spill that breach spillway crest. Um, yeah, that's that's something to to play around with the initial conditions and um, like you say, if we start the precipitation, I'm not sure if I'm quick enough to uh, go in into this table and and change that. Maybe I can. If Anthony wants to do his example problem, I can do that in the background and change these time dates while leaving the precipitation the same and see what, see what happens. So Brent, I have a question. This is Gary. Um, how is the breach spillway uh, elevation discharge developed? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> it's from, from the O&M. <laughs> um, I'm okay. just looking at it. it. So it starts at, the crest is uh, 6,008.5. And then on the, 
on the discharge curve, the next point is at elevation 6,011.32 at 12.5 CFS. Shot. So it's, it. it seems like a pretty, that's, you know, we're looking, it's that. almost three feet rise okay, and we're only okay. passing 12 CFS. Yeah. So I just wonder if maybe there's an issue with that. Okay, one of these. I, I yeah. haven't looked at that before. I just did that now because because of what Carl was saying that the base flow seemed to be rising it, causing it to rise. Here's the breach spillway. So another thing um, that you'd need to be aware of in in HMS is that you can't. Um, let's see. How do I? How do I say this? There's, you've you've got to have the these values have to increase. So you couldn't have. I, I think looking at this, um, you know, you you couldn't have two different elevations that had the same yeah. flow rate, or it'll well, it'll yeah. crash so if you, you do were that. Pick um, those points off of that curve. Yeah. So I so I digitized this curve, um, yeah. and and certainly there, yeah, there could be more error where I am, am squinting to to do that here absolutely yeah. um, you could you could mod you, know, you could Go ahead. I was just gonna say you could try uh, you know modeling it as a as a broad crested weir or whatever you'd like and see see what yeah, you think um, of your I results. I wonder if an independent uh, model of that might be worth it because it for the photos it looks like it's pretty wide. Um, and you would think that, you know, uh, just a little bit of depth of flow would be pretty significant over that. I, I would think, but maybe not. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, that'd be worth doing that. Two feet of reservoir raise. You've been there. John. Well, that's scary. That curve is saying that if you have three feet of depth going over that spillway crest, you're only at 12 and a half CFS. And I gotta believe it's probably more than that. I mean, that that width looked to me looked like it was maybe 15 feet or something like that. That's, it's really hard to jump across. <laughs> go. Yeah, here's the, um, oops. Pretty little creek. I don't know. I, yeah. Might be worthwhile to try an independent. Yeah, I I that. agree with that advice definitely. Ten CFS is a mean flow. It should be typical to even up there that time of year. Or does it look like it's? You know, I looked at that photo and I thought, well, that could be ten CFS. It was. It was taken in August. So it's probably more like two minutes. And there's no, remember the outlet is inoperable. So there's, that's, that's all of, well, I guess apart from the seepage, that is the only flow leaving the dam. That might be a reality check. See if we find a spring shot of it. But the goal of this is just to, to go through some of the mechanics of, of running an HMS model. Um, without having to, to type in thousands of lines ourselves. So, great feedback though. I'm gonna make, make notes. <laughs> I think that dam could fail with two feet of additional water. I think it's that deficient. <clears throat> Geotechnically, not technically. Have you been there in the spring? I, been there, well, you can't really get there. I've been, the earliest I've been there is in July. <coughs> so I'm going to stop sharing. I don't know the answer. That's all I've got for that uh, example problem. And then I think we've got Anthony with a, with a harder one. How are we, how are we doing? Do we want to yeah, lunch is here. Take lunch is there. Okay. Yeah, ours is. Gonna get kind of back rolling on this thing. Brent, are you out there?
I'm here. I'm ready. I'm ready to get rolling. Uh, the traffic. Ooh. I think uh, do you slide. Did you give us a go back? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you should be able to um, share your screen. I'm not sharing mine, am I? Okay. <clears throat> oh, no, no, Atlas working will be out December twenty three. That's cool. Mark showed this. Uh, I think most of the CNRC regional engineer folks got this training invite for uh, course giving for the bringing clothes and stuff. I'm going to go to that. Oops. Look at the other building. All right. So um, I guess we'll, we'll open up an example problem three. Uh, I know that I save these to the one drive, I zip them before I put them in there. So you're gonna have to go into wherever you have to save and extract them first. All right, uh, I'm going to go to open that one up, browse, desktop, test models. What's that, Mark? Um, did you, which model did you open up? This okay, one. so go back to the desktop. Uh, it was in the HC models, and I was opening example problem two. Um, I don't, I guess I, I thought I would extract it from the same folder, and I didn't, so I don't know exactly where it went. Which is good. Always. Oh, so we're supposed to we do two or three. We we're gonna do three. three? Um, oh, you said two last time. Oh, we're yeah, we're gonna do three total examples, but we're gonna do two now. Sorry. So we're doing example problem two. Which model? <laughs> <laughs> Let's open example example model. Well, how much time do we have left? We only have forty minutes. No, we've got. Uh, three plus three is seven. Okay, no, total oh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Plus. And then we're, we're going to do 30 minutes of wrap up and closing time, or what do you think for timeline here? I think the idea was to try to finish at 1 30. Everything. Okay. Uh, if you haven't, are we going to have much for closing regards at this point? Is anyone anticipating having a large half hour worth of closing, or should we just kind of do some modeling for the next hour or so? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I was selecting a destination for this to be extracted. Um, I'm going to put it in the same model folder this time. And the desktop that looks right, and I'll extract it. So we're doing two. Yep, now for problem two. I'll, I'm going to extract this while we're here. Hey Anthony, I think you're sharing only the HMS screen, and I, I wonder oh, if, if it would be sure easier if you just shared the entire desktop window. You know. Thanks, Brent. Yeah. You um, share. How's that? 
Looks great. So yeah, I'm, I'm extracting. This is uh, example problem three. Put it here. And desktop HMS models. I like to work in, in all the agents and stuff. I like to work off of my desktop or at least on my C drive. Um, it seems to be kind of painful to work on these if you're, you have them in a shared file server or they're routed to a OneDrive. It's a, it's a lot. They kind of reference back to your file server. So saving them on your C drive seems to be kind of the best practice. Now, and if you go to browse back in the HMS. Uh, HCH mass models, and we have example problems two or three here that we just extracted. We're going to problem two and HMS file. And we go into this and expand the base of models. We have this, uh, we have two base models in this one. Uh, I set it up that way. Just this one's just a, pretty much an exact copy of this one. The only difference is um, it it still has the terrain data, but when you make a copy, um, it it kind of messes up some of the visualization properties of the terrain and stuff. So I just turned that off. I didn't want to go through and reset those. So it, it still has the associated terrain like this one in, in the second model, but. You have to go through and kind of define the symbology for, for all your layers. And instead of doing that, I just kind of turn them on. So, uh, looking at reservoir number two, the biggest, the only difference in between uh, basin two higher and basin two lower is this reservoir initial starting elevation that we've discussed. Um, just you know, look at if we run these both at a different starting pool. Uh, what that looks like graphically. So if you're in here and you go to compute, we'll go to this multiple compute and we'll select all and we'll click compute and it'll run one, it'll run two. For the, the only difference here is you can use the two different basic models. So you can set up uh, simulation runs like, like Brent showed you in the last example for, um, you can select different basic models. You can select different control specifications. You can select different uh, meteorological conditions, which we'll look at a little bit in the next one. It has different meteorological conditions, but um, just for this one, we're just going to run it for these two different starting water surface elevations. Uh, if you go to simulation run, you have this guy with the starting elevation is higher and this is lower. You can expand your reservoir table. And I'm going to go in on this like pool elevation. And I'm going to go on this one. I'm going to select pool elevation. And I'm going to make the graph bigger. You can kind of see uh, the, the different the elevations are getting cut off. But cut off doesn't display very well on this. Did you combine those? So Gary, there's a couple ways to do it. You can uh, you can grab it and drag it to your plot, or you can hold the control key and grab them out of. Uh, so if you hold the control key and kick them, click on them, you'll get more things. And then once you actually have the plot, it that's got cool results. We want to look at uh, the combined and flow and the full elevation for, for the, the lower starting uh, water surface elevation and then the combined and flow and the full elevation for the higher. <coughs> so the combined and flow graph is, is lots more top of each other. So it's just the same. Right? For now, I didn't grab the right one. Just 
But anyways, this is just kind of the, some of the graphical stuff you can, you can visualize. Uh, didn't really plan on spending a whole, not a whole lot of time on this one. Um, I think Frank covered a lot of it. Uh, so that's kind of all I wanted to look at, just some, some options for running multiple simulations. Um, there's no questions there. We'll go on to the, the third example. I just have a few questions on the DSS. What is it? DSS view? ACCDSS view. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a, how important is that? Do we? Uh, so DSS is data storage system. So it's like a, it's a database where, where pretty much all this stuff is incorporated. Um, if, if you go in there, uh, a, a lot of the, the these similar things are, are all viewable in the DSS fold in the DSS application. Um, and if you're looking at using any real grid data, it becomes more important. It's I guess you don't need it to import stuff. It's kind of more of a background application at this point. They allow you to import graded data uh, directly in HMS now if you go to import uh, import graded data. I think this is kind of new with 4.8. Prior to 4.8, you couldn't import graded data directly. I think you had to do it in like a DSS application. Um, and you would import your your created data into DSS, and then you could create um, your files to to bring into HMS there. But now I think you have the functionality to do all your created data stuff in the, the agency main interface. Okay. Um, but what about what about exporting it? If you're exporting the yeah, exporting the created data or uh, right your results. Because that's what we've used H. That's what we've used DSS View for mostly, is for looking at the the uh, results a lot. It was made it a lot easier to to view the results. I, I know what you're saying, Chad. It does make uh, some of that stuff easier. Uh, like if you want to view your results in like a tabular kind of Excel sheet format. Yeah. Then not yeah. That would be probably the best way to grab it. Um, as opposed to viewing it just as, as a chart or something here. Right. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Right, so there's they don't have that function to export it to from here. You have to use view still. Um, I guess you could always, if I have, what do we have highlighted here? Uh, for the time series. Outflow, outflow, and then we grab this one up here. So you got your alpha here, and you can you can grab it like this if you really want. Um, and you just kind of you know do a feel copy paste move from here. Okay. Just go grab them all. So it's not as important as it used to be in the past. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, maybe it's too all. Yeah, it's only letting me grab one column at a time, but. Yeah, I think you could you could probably get away without it if you use this this guy here to, to okay. grab whatever uh, kind of data set you're interested in. Get your full elevation and then click on the that one you just didn't scroll down through here and <laughs> grab them and uh, put them into an Excel or or uh, your data process application of choice. There's one. Okay. Curve that's kind of interesting to look at. That's an excess precipitation curve. Okay, I was I was thinking I was going to pull that one up in the next one when we ran multiple meteorologic right. model draw. Sure. Uh, but I, I do agree that that one is uh, is very interesting. Are we at all concerned about results at all? Because so if I recall the, the one starts at an elevation around six thousand. Yep. And the other at six thousand eight. Yep. If you look at the peak. Reservoir elevation, there's only like 4.4 foot difference for the. So, uh, so the, uh, I don't know how, maybe there's, this one doesn't have a whole lot of storage below in that, that extra AC. Must, must be, um, for that, that was that 25 year event is filling it and then, and then some. But the end then some is more significant when it starts at a higher level. Um, 
Well, it just seems like if you told them they had to keep their pool level eight feet below the crest of that breach spillway, it's not going to make much difference for uh, well, at least the 25 or so. It's kind, of, it's kind of what you're talking about, where yeah. it's, it's only, you know, uh, yeah. uh, very significantly less, uh, I think just a little bit more, like less than a foot more. Yep. Um, whereas this one that starts, I, I'm assuming that's, you know, it's pretty far down. Uh, oh, yeah, that would seem pretty significant. Yeah. No, but it, it really doesn't change the, the total pool. That much, and that might come back to your comment on the spillway. Mm -hmm. um, it is raining here, it might not, uh, it might perform differently if you use that broadcast if we're to evaluate that spillway. How do they maintain a reduced flow when they shut down that one? They use the breach for way for us to the water. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it, it's just the breach elevation. Uh, but this, the, but the, the the lower one started, I think, eight feet below the area. That's yeah. And me and Brent had this discussion kind of before we we did this. This is that's an unrealistic thing for this. They would need a siphon or a pump or something to get it that low. Gotcha. But um, yeah. I had a thought in the middle of that and it just got away from me. Uh, anyways, uh, oh, the, just looking at the spillways is something that's kind of, kind of interesting here. We have the two spillways. Uh, and we can this when we have the like 100 year and more significant event. Uh, but under neither one of these conditions is that secondary spillway as well. What are the time increments for horizontal axis? Eight. Those days. So Gary, to answer your question, we uh, reduced the level test by time, just not much elements. Steve. All right, well, let's uh, pop into this other model really quickly and look at that. Uh, go to the browse and uh, at the top, wherever you have it saved, example problem three. Open that and open the .hms file. I'll ask you one quick question. How'd you, get, how'd you expand your horizontal axis so quickly? You know, you did that very definitely. Oh, I just grabbed the, the window and pulled it over. Uh, if you if you hit the graph tab at the in the top once you ran it, uh, you just did a multiple compute run. I kind of flushed a little yeah. bit. Oh, sorry, I was. We can we can go through that. I was just trying to uh, answer Rob's question about how the axis was off. I just grabbed this one and it seemed to populate on the drag instead of uh, when I hit the maximize window on that originally. It it didn't really like it. Like it was your your axis is kind of unlabeled here, and then I hit the maximize and it stays unlabeled. Uh, just kind of a must be a software bug kind of thing there. Uh, but it's, Drag it, drag it, it seems to populate that with the character information. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, kind of back to the, the components part of this. All I did there, Michelle, was to run it is to go to compute and then this multiple compute option. I think we have uh, these different simulation runs already set up. Um, Similar to the one we did the last time, and you can do this select all, and you can run them quickly, and it'll run everything you have selected, um, which is kind of nice for like if we're going to change the, the, the curve number in the basic model. 
you want to change your curve number to something like, I think we were running 66 earlier. Uh, and you want to use that. Or then you can do the, the multiples and do it there again with the, the different spacing or with the different curve number. Um, you can create a copy of the spacing. All basic copies. And you run one with uh, curve number 66 and one with a curve number at 60. And then, like Barry, Barry talked about, every time you do something like that, you gotta go into your time sleep, right? So you can, right? You go into your basements and you have a copy, you gotta say yes. Okay. these plus we have a hundred here with a different curve number. Except all but anyway this one I just I like to view the result in so uh, aside from from adding the, the extra base model was everyone able to view the multiple compute on that yeah um, and then the view you go to your view results uh, I like this. This one is kind of where we were going for our uh, for our pseudo calibration type stuff we were working on. We were looking at combined uh, the reservoirs. We're going to look at combined inflow. And then you go two years, hundred year. Nice that one, Rob. Add the outflow. Might not be able to do this with having just one screen. <clears throat> Precipitation one for uh, any of the different storm events. Some basis for different storm events. And the reservoir. Excess 
You zoom in on the horizontal axis on there? Yes. So like say three billion or something. So what do you Stay excess up. precipitation? What what does that mean? Is that that's what's actually going into the model and what's going to come out from the stream. That's what did not end up Right. Sure. But what I'd like to know is understand why it wraps up like that. Uh, so I guess we look at our I guess you're, uh, I think Rob's wondering about on the excess, if goes, the excess goes up. Or goes down. Unless it has something to do with how it mathematically based on the losses. It's kind of showing that each given precipitation rate, there's a a ramping down in the filtration rate, which makes sense. Or maybe just a general ramping down in the filtration rate, which also makes sense. Yeah, so the first peak is the peak from the rainfall, but the second peak is the a peak you get because your infiltration losses, your initial abstractions really drop off. <clears throat> yeah, you'd have to read up on how HS does the CS curve method losses. Can, can you overlap the the hydrograph? The hydrograph? You mean? Or, yeah, no, the hydrograph. The hydrograph in in flow for uh, a specific event or what? You yeah, just do it for the. Cumulative in or outflow for the outflow, yeah. Or not cumulative, let's just stick to it. Outflow. It's not going to overlap it. I was just trying to see how that matched up with the excess precip, but we're not going to be able to see that. Actually, that's an interesting graph. It's a clicker. It's a clicker. He's clicker. He's clicker. He's clicker. He's clicker. He knows his way around. My mind works through it. We're three slides farther up. What I was going to observe is the peak stage is happening towards the end of the excess period of excess precipitation. It's hard to tell the scale, but. <clears throat> yeah, I I like looking at the time series too. too. I, mean, I can look at graphs and stuff, but time series too it seems to. So uh, you, know, you, you know, you look at the. Well, you have direct flow and then base flow. You see that the base flow contributes a lot. Or the storm really kicks in. 
really good thing to look at is the percent loss columns. And initially, they're identical, but it's 100% loss. Yeah. So you get down to uh, right about there. Yeah. yeah. 17 hours later. Yeah. So can be access. Right. Uh, So even pretty far to start, you know, like, like, look at that, look at, look, you're zooming past, <laughs> look at that, where you have a point, well, let's see, where did it peak? 0.38 inches of precipitation. I think that's your peak, right? And you lost 0.37. You lost all but one one hundredth of an inch from the wall. And whether that's realistic or not, I guess it's worth considering. Well, there's a lot of trees on this thing. I can tell you from the spruce trees that water never reaches the ground underneath them. So might be realistic. But it's, I, I think, worth observing, you know, through all that heaviest part of the presentation, 0 0.12, 0 0.12, 0 0.38, 0 0.22. Yep. Look how teeny, you know, it's actually remains in the model. It's, it's a very small percentage. Yeah. I think somebody asked about why we didn't do the 24 year uh, storm event and why we used the 72 year. I think for our, 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 oh, yes, if not 72 year. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, we, when we tried to model the, the 24 event, 24 hour event, we got next to no runoff with this methodology. So probably do something you know, very similar to what this table is um, instead of having, you know, 10 or 15 rows of it, we, we get some excess precipitation that runs off. We just weren't getting it. Really any. Yeah. Also, a potential of a hiatus graph as opposed to like, <coughs> yes, yes. Exactly. Not that it should back over. Yeah, so if you were to use like the USBR flood hydrology method instead of the USGS one, if you had a, a peak at the two thirds point, you'd probably get much more effective. Yeah. I think then there's some uh, HMS will distribute it for you if you just give them a cumulative depth at a time. Oh. Uh, and they, they have some different distributions there. Right. Um, kind of basically, just depending on kind of the distribution. I think it's type one, type two, or type three distribution. Right. Um, and they basically an S shaped graph and, and they manipulate it and it gets kind of a little bit shorter and fatter and, and taller and longer in the middle um, depending on the different types but that's kind of a, a really if you were just looking to put one of these together like as fast as you could you could get in a, a, a hypothetical depth and use one of their be done as distribution um, and, and get them all of it lost pretty quickly and the effective precipitation number I was talked about that you'd have to look around, it'd be up in the header, you would see how much actually ran off compared to how much fell out of the sky. And that is just a ratio, and it's one ratio for each run, and it's maybe something to worth being aware of. Where's that at? Um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's the model results. You can look at the summary, probably the summary. See, you could probably, I would think you could take a, a direct runoff volume and divide it by precipitation volume. Or, but yeah, uh -huh. try it. <clears throat> I think it's 0. 0.42 divided by 2.22 is, is the uh, effective precipitation, which is quite low. You know, you have uh, one sixth of of the rain actually remains the model, I think. Right? Uh, it's less than that, right? right? Something like that. You know, I don't, for an extreme storm, that would be, you know, maybe not that good. <clears throat> I don't know about in these more frequent events, you would have. Uh, well, lower effective precipitation. Yeah, as you can see here, we got base flow volume of one inch, so you got twice as much volume coming in as the base flow. 
Yeah. But uh, that accounts for the, I think the whole 15 days that we run it for. And the storm events really just did 72 hours. So we're getting kind of some, that's probably, you know, two or three times larger than, than what it would need to be if we just kind of focused our, our study and not just the storm event. But yeah, it, it is still uh, a significant portion of these high frequency events. But anyway, I would suggest just coming up with that ratio and making a mental note of it on all your marble rocks. And then over time, you know, maybe that's one number. It's not, you know, it's something you can just kind of maybe build some some knowledge, some comfort, some awareness of. Yeah. Um, good comments, good suggestions. Uh, Anybody online got anything that they want to talk about? Trent? Questions, comments, something I missed? I'm sure I missed something. Have you discussed um, the importance of looking at snowmelt runoff or rainfall on snow as part of the assessment? Uh, I think it is important. I know that HMS has some functionality and it will model rain on snow events. I haven't done that myself. Kathy, I know you work with uh, the SNOWDAS data sets sometimes and some other uh, spatially distributed snow data. Uh, did you have some some train of thought you wanted to go on on that or uh, anything you want to share in that stuff? Well, at this point, no, I don't. I mean, I haven't used HMS um, in quite a while, along with looked at their snow melt capabilities. I use other watershed models um, that include this, the energy balance, basically, for snow melt. Um, but it seems like at least looking at you know your site and that area and when floods occur to check for if they occur mostly during snow melt season to, to start understanding that part of it. Kathy, what other models do you use? What are you referencing? So um, the models I've been using are not for peak flow for floods. They're mostly looking at like daily, a daily water balance. So mostly for um, non-flood stream flow, like daily stream flow, but um, yeah, that's that's where I'm trying to wrap my head around how you would come up with peak stream flows from those models. But um, so the USGS has a model called PRMS. I, well, I think some folks at DNRC have used that model, and more and more um, agencies are using the WARF model, the National Hydrologic Model, out of the Weather Service. But I think the online version of that model is not very well calibrated at this point. Do you know uh, a good way of getting a hydrograph or a hydrograph using some of those distributed snow data sets? I have not. The, and I'm just bringing up the question because I know snow melt is important, you know, for, for especially Western Montana. Well, we have hydrometrics monitors a whole bunch of high mountain dams for over the and it is problematic, uh, just a lack of data. You know, we've got one snow tell site in the uh, western range of the Mitterrand that we use for all of the dams <laughs> in the Mitterrand. You got one, and it's at an elevation of like 6,000 feet. Our highest one was at 7,200 feet. So you know there's going to be huge differences, but you do the best that you can. And, and we just take the historic. Uh, Snow water equivalent numbers and create hydrographs based on those um, as they change over the spring and we come up with an inflow and we put it in the reservoir. And I will tell you that for those high mountain dams, that snow belt is it's, it's what drives the spillway cycle. It's not the rainfall, it's the snow melt events. Because there's some pretty dramatic ones that have occurred just, just since I've been here. Uh, 1988 to now, there's been some pretty significant snow melt events that really created a hazard. So, 
you guys look at any of the like Snowdass spatially <coughs> distributed snow data? No, I just don't. just the gauge for the point data. And I don't I don't even know how you begin to do rain on snow. Like, well, snow melt category in here, but I don't know how either. Like the snow melt thing. Yeah. You can check. Well, I mean, you could do the same thing you're talking about and then add in. Add in. Rain, yeah. Rainfall it, onto it. Because very little of that rainfall is going to stay in the snow. It's going to come off. Uh, at most of our high mountain sites, it's solid rock anyway. So anything comes off right. pretty darn quick. And that's what, I mean, that's what triggered that 1964 flood. And so, in addition to the Snowdass models, yeah, the, the, sure was, the, <laughs> what was one of the anchor stars they used to develop the hydro meteorological? What's the name of those? Hydro meteorological. Thank you. So, sure, that one for PMM or P. So, yeah, in oh, addition. In addition to the NOAA SNOWDAS models, our, our Montana Climate Office has developed some snow models that are more specific to Montana. And if I can find information about that, I'll put it in the chat. I think I just saw something on that the other day and I can't remember what it was called when. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that's kind of germane to this whole exercise is like, with, say, the 10 year, 25 year um, events that are in uh, the stream stats. At, at a site like this, that'll have a strong snow melt uh, component, you know, embedded within it. And that's probably going to be the dominant component in there. And yet, we're using it to calibrate a rainfall runoff model that doesn't consider it snow melt. So, that's, I don't know what the implications are there, but it's definitely uh, something you wear. Pseudo calibrated. Pseudo calibrated, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the snow melt definitely probably affects the, the gauge values that are used to develop the regression of the equations. For sure. Uh, at, the, at, the low, at the higher frequency events, at the low, low frequency events, rainfall is going to predominate. You know, the 500 year event, those sorts of things, those can't be snow. The snow can only melt at a finite rate. But for what it's worth, HMS online has a whole section on modeling snow melt. It's very complicated. It looks complicated, but it's <laughs> there. <laughs> Energy from radiation. You're saying that stream sites give you solar radiation? Yeah, but it's the winds, not the snow. So when we get those wind events at the most high elevations, uh, the ocean that's coming over low temperatures, that's what takes the snow off. We're still going to do a pseudo calibration model, right? Oh. Right. I guess my suggestion on the pseudo calibration is I think we still have the stream set stuff to look at it really quick. Uh, Yeah, we are going to run out of time, but yeah, if there's, if we could pick up what we got and compare it to the stream set. I think we have the kinetic cell sheet that was back there with that graph that we were looking at. And uh, Rob made a comment on the maybe our flows were a little bit low and could have been standard deviation higher. Right. Um, so we have that. Mm -hmm. 
over the 100 year peak in our model. Seventy-one point six, and then for our hundred year over here, the peak discharge is seventy-two point eight, um, which is it's pretty close. I think this is uh, this is using the curve number of was it sixty-six? That's on right. Page two is curve number one. Oh, 60. But what was what was the HMS result? Fifth year. Well, was, well, let's stick to the hundred. What, what, what are we at? Yeah. 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 But okay, so Rob, if you were to try to adjust that, what would, what would you do? Because you would like to see that probably a little higher, right? But still, it depends the, on the purpose, but almost the spilling design for sure. The spilling compliance, probably. I don't know if you just say it. Bank on that. <laughs> if you're a regulator or working for the owner, right? <laughs> you, want to, you want to justify <clears throat> well, 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 go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. 73 point seven. If you're going in on the horizontal axis, it's probably as a recurrence interval that's less than 100 years, I'm not sure. Maybe substantially less than 20, 25 years. <clears throat> So Michelle, how would you treat these? You, are you looking for conservatism and trying to evaluate um, these? I mean, I, it's I probably would, a stupid question to ask for rate. But. No, I would say we wouldn't want to be conservative because we're we're trying. I mean, for the for this problem and for what Butte's facing, is we're trying to understand the risk. So I would argue that you'd want to be as accurate as possible. So that you know, and but you'd want to look at a number of different return intervals. So, um, so once you get the, the spillway rating curve corrected, and run that again, and say a, a twenty-five year storm does raise the reservoir two feet, well, that's that's pretty serious. If if it's a hundred year storm that raises it, well, that's less of a concern. So I I think since the end result is to make some risk informed decision making, you wouldn't want to have any conservative bias in there. That would be my argument. I I, I think it, we have to be really cautious because there's a tendency to put conservatism in, upon conservatism. Now, if they were using it for design, that would be different. But since they are using it for risk informed decision making, we want to shoot for as accurate as possible. And what I'm saying is because of the uncertainty, um, the recurrent uh, 73.7 number is going to happen much more frequently than once in 100 years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's because of that uncertainty. And so what's missing from the decision making matrix is uh, like a quantifiable way to incorporate the uncertainty. If, if you had stream gauge data, uh, 100 years of stream gauge data, you have real tight limits, you'd feel real good about those numbers. But with the wide bands, um, you can't feel as good about it. You know, uh, a, a good way to think of it is uh, in that, that's like, well, that, that has a, a measurable effect, I guess, on decision making. Yeah, and a lot of it would be how you presented it. Like, uh, I really like that table.
table that Gary or that graph that came from TR55, <coughs> something like that. You'd have to, in communicating with the, the dam owner, you'd have to somehow capture what you're saying. Well, here's, a, here's a good analogy is uh, for just the uncertainty part, it doesn't get to the bias part, but just the uncertainty part is, is like, let's say it's going to be a silly example, but let's say you're trying to shoot an apple off somebody's head. And, uh, and, you, and you don't have any uncertainty, you can aim right at the apple and, and everything's good. You have no unfavorable outcome. But if you have like, uh, you know, if you're shaky and you have some uncertainty bounds, then if you don't want to have an unfavorable outcome, you need to define what failure rate you're willing to accept. So let's say it's one in 100 or one in 10 or whatever you select. And then you do have to achieve that by biasing it upwards somewhere. And, and so the uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty is important for the decision-making process. You can't shoot the best estimate regard, with, regardless of the uncertainty, you know, because you have to account for that unfavorable outcome. I, I agree. I think the biggest challenge would be, you know, I, I imagine the consultants in the room probably run into this all the time, is presenting that to the dam owner in an understandable manner. So like how you came up with this result, how are you going to explain that to Butte so that they understand? Well, I think hydrology is missing a, a, a method for doing that. Most other engineering disciplines have that, whether yeah. it's structural or geotechnical. They have a way to design things so that you don't have, that everybody agrees upon, so you don't have an unfavorable outcome. I agree. Okay, so you're good? I'm good. You good? I'm, I'm good. So I don't think we have enough, anything really to, to wrap up. Um, Brent? Were you going to email everyone a, uh, a PDH certificate? Yes, we will email everybody PDH certificates in person and Zoom. Those uh, should be good. Yeah, I was going to say those should be good for your PE or your CFM.